Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is the election of a member for appointment to the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. I have received one valid nomination for appointment. The nomination is John Pentland. The question is that John Pentland be selected for appointment to the Scottish pa Parliamentary Corporate Body. Members should press their yes, no or abstain buttons now. Thank you. The result of the vote is yes, 32, no, zero. There were 16 abstentions. As the majority of members have voted in favour, John Pentland is duly selected for appointment to the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. Can I offer my congratulations to John Pentland? Can I also take this opportunity on behalf of the corporate body members to thank Dave Stewart, uh, who has been a member since 2011 and has done absolutely sterling work on your behalf in the corporate body. And I look forward, as I know my colleagues are, to working with John Pentland in the future. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12060 in the name of Michael Matheson on commending the people who keep Scotland safe in emergencies. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, around 14 minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am grateful for this opportunity to recognise the excellent work undertaken by the emergency services across Scotland. The emergency services are both individually and collectively services in which we can be incredibly proud. Brave and dedicated men and women who are prepared to put their lives on the line on a daily basis to ensure we are kept safe and who, when called upon, respond quickly and without hesitation to rescue, provide care and to manage any incident or event. Although we uh, all... I'll give way to the member. Yep. Gil Patterson. With regards to your point uh, on an incident, uh, I'm sure the Minister will be uh, aware of the traumatic and tragic incident that took place at Clydebank Police Station last week. And I would, uh, would the Minister agree with me that the emergency services and the police in particular are sometimes thought to have a suit of steel around their emotions when in fact under the, the uniform is a mere human being who is to be commended in, for their professional conduct and attitude. And I hope that the whole chamber indeed will want to let them know that they have our full support under these circumstances, but more importantly, should they need it, they'll get the personal support as well. Uh, yes, sir. Officer, I'm aware of the uh, terrible incident that took place in uh, Clydebank uh, Police Station uh, last week and of course the emergency services responded in a, uh, an exemplary way in order to uh, deal with that particular uh, issue. Uh, and as I'm sure the member will recognise that again in uh, 2014 uh, we have witnessed events of a catastrophic proportion in Glasgow City Centre at the end of uh, the year, a time traditionally reserved for uh, family and friends and uh, good spirits. Uh, and as we also uh, had uh, unfortunately witnessed to the unfortunate accident involving the cargo ship, the Kemiford, uh, on route from Denmark to Cheshire, which despite an extensive search of land and sea, uh, the eight crewmen uh, from the vessel have not been found. Then, officer, I would again like to pass on our thoughts and condolences to all of the families and friends of the loved ones who have lost their lives and also to share our thoughts with those who are still being treated and to those who were caught up in or witnessed these tragic events. It is at times like these uh, that we see our emergency services act so bravely, selflessly, effectively and timelessly. 
For the immediate uh, and fast work of the first responders, uh, the staff of NHS Scotland to provide uh, the injured with the best care and attention, and to those who uh, quickly put in place arrangements to support families uh, and those affected uh, members of the public, uh, we owe our gratitude. However, we should not forget that the men and women of our emergency services, although highly trained, feel the same pain, fear and emotion and go home at the end of each shift to family and loved ones still carrying the scars of what they have witnessed. Officer, earlier today, I met with uh, some of the police officers who were first on the scene uh, at the Glasgow bin lorry accident, the uh, deceased victim uh, identification officers and the family liaison officers who supported the families uh, and uh, following the events in Glasgow on the 22nd of December. I was struck by their professionalism and their dedication and the way in which they responded, some of whom responded while well off duty but within the area. Uh, and one uh, young uh, new police officer who was only five weeks into his probationary training uh, was one of the first on the scene. Of course, however, uh, it's not just events at home that raise our attention, concern and our thoughts. The chilling events in France last week make only too real the risk that are faced on a daily basis. The work of the voluntary uh, sector emergency organisations is also increasingly intrinsic to Scotland's multi-agency approach to emergency response. Their commitment, dedication and courage is highly valued by the Scottish Government, by the communities that they serve and by Scotland's emergency services with whom they work shoulder to shoulder. They have a unique capability to put boots on the ground in communities during emergencies as well as through what they can also do in tackling long-term and challenging uh, recovery processes. We regularly witness uh, through the selfless work of the Scottish Mountain Rescue Teams who provide a frontline world-class voluntary search and rescue service helping those in need of assistance on a 24-7, 365 days a year basis. In 2013, 780 people were assisted across 590 incidents, during which the 27 volunteer mountain rescue teams gave over 27,000 volunteer hours. A remarkable achievement by all of those involved. This selfless work on land is replicated at sea by the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. Again for 2013, the 236 vital lifeboat stations around our coast undertook 995 launches with 1,007 rescues, saving some 29 lives. Altogether, more than some 37,000 hours were logged by the volunteer crews. This is a huge life-saving resource. Medical support is also provided by the volunteers of St Andrews First Aid and the British Red Cross, who, gave up, who give up their time to attend a range of events across Scotland, from football matches to music events, to ensure that everyone can enjoy themselves safely. And within the Blue Light Services, we must acknowledge uh, the excellent work done by special constables and by lay advisors within Police Scotland. Uh, the retained duty system and the volunteer firefighters who play a vital role in keeping communities safe, in particular within the rural and remote areas. <coughs> Officer, Scotland's communities too continue to play an important role, using their skills and knowledge and commitment in ways that complement the work of the emergency responders, including local community resilience groups, the Volunteer Community First Responders Scheme, supported by the Scottish Ambulance Service, and the Police Scotland Youth Volunteer Programme, who provides young people, uh, which provides young people between the ages of 13 and 18 with the opportunity to gain confidence and develop leadership skills by working with the police and volunteering in their local area. In 2013-14, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service attended almost 28,000 fires and the Scottish Ambulance Service saw an increase in their emergency responses, responding to over 650,000 incidents, reaching life-threatening incidents in an average of 6.5 minutes. And over the course of the last year, 
Police Scotland have responded to more than 497,000 emergency calls raised through the 999 route. Officer, 2014 did, of course, bring a lot to celebrate. We must acknowledge the role played by the emergency services in delivering a successful Commonwealth Games and Ryder Cup. The high level of pre-planning and resource that was committed to ensuring that both these events could progress safely, without incident and with the resilience in place to react if, where and when uh, gave confidence to all of those who took part and who attended these events. A fact that will have not gone unnoticed by the thousands of visitors and spectators who came to Scotland and who in turn will have taken away a lasting impression. We can, uh, not, of course, we can uh, not, of course, overlook the significant prevention activities that our emergency services and voluntary organisations are actively engaged in. A good example is the Ready for Winter campaign, delivered for the fourth time this winter. This has been a true success, in no small part due to the work that our emergency responders have taken forward to deliver its important message. And the work being progressed through Education Scotland, working with schools and local authorities to help pupils to understand how to prepare for and cope with emergencies as part of Curriculum for Excellence. Meanwhile, uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is committed to reducing the number of accidental dwelling fires in Scotland through a programme of home safety visits, targeted at those who are most vulnerable of a risk, uh, the risk of fire within their home. Figures show that some 71,000 home safety visits were carried out during the period of 2013-14. Of course, it's not just frontline officers that we have to thank, but all the staff who, in so many different ways, helped to make our emergency services exemplary. However, Zain Officer, whilst we reflect on the positives, we cannot fail to acknowledge that there are challenges ahead. Let me reassure this Parliament and the people of Scotland that this Government is committed to supporting our emergency services and, in doing so, ensuring that the commitment uh, the communities of Scotland continue to receive the excellent level of service, protection and support that they have come to rely on. Be that through our continued commitment to 1,000 extra police officers, our shared goal to ensure that local priorities remain at the heart of our emergency services, or the importance we place on ensuring that the nearest and most suitable resources are available to respond to incidents, irrespective of their location. We have seen the benefit of access to specialist resource and equipment across the country following the introduction of a single police and fire service, an example of which has been the utilisation of these resources for the tragic incident which took place at the Clutter Bar in 2013. In health, the highly skilled staff of the Scottish Ambulance Service Special Operations Response Team respond day to day to major incidents across Scotland, working closely with their colleagues within the ambulance service and other emergency services to ensure that the very best care is provided to patients, regardless of where they are. And we also had the launch in April 2014 of ScotStar, bringing together, under the auspices of the Scottish Ambulance Service, the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service, the transportation of critically ill adults, children and babies, demonstrating clear collaborative working across the NHS boards. This has been rightly recognised as being a world-class initiative. In meeting the challenges ahead, the benefit of shared resources, increase, increased collaboration and partnership working will be key. And I am aware that our emergency services are already jointly considering opportunities for this that can in turn improve the safety and well-being of our communities. Beyond the blue lights, there are, of course, a wide range of organisations who work together to help to facilitate a successful conclusion to emergency events, not least uh, during difficult weather uh, similar to what we are presently experiencing, both public and private sector, uh, emergency operatives such as SEPA, the Met Office, local authorities, Transport Scotland, utility and telecom companies 
who, in emergencies, meet with resilience coordinators and Scottish Government resilience room officials to support the frontline response, and they are key to ensuring that we cooperate in response and to recover issues quickly and to reduce disruption where possible. We saw the benefits of this cooperation by the work only this week, when homes and businesses on the Isle of Col were isolated from power and ferries and aviation it were cancelled due to bad weather. The partnership between the Scottish Government, working in uh, coordination with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency and with Scottish and Southern Energy, arranged for a helicopter to be provided in call in order to get power back on in what were extremely challenging conditions. Sign officer, the work undertaken by the men and women of our emergency services should rightly be recognised by this Parliament. To go to work each day, not knowing from one minute to the next what you might be faced with, is not something that we could all easily adapt to. And yet, it is one that all of our emergency services colleagues willingly sign up to. Be it the management of significant incidents, the quick response to local accidents and emergencies, or the ability to provide comfort and calm at times when individuals and communities may be at their most vulnerable. We have a lot to commend the men and women of our emergency services. In closing, President Officer, I would ask that Parliament joins me in recognising this work and commitment to support them in the year ahead and to support the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Hugh Henry to speak to you and move amendment number 12060.2. Mr Henry, about 10 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name. President Officer, there are some things in life that we have come to take for granted. Thanks to the struggles of previous generations, we take for granted the right to an education, a health service and decent housing. We expect our power supply to be available when we need it. And we expect in an emergency that our emergency services will be there for us. But in one respect, it's good that as a civilised society, we have high expectations and mostly these expectations are delivered. But taking things for granted should never be an excuse for ignoring or saying nothing about those whose efforts help to meet our high expectations. Emergency services are a good example of services that we want we need and we value, but we always hope we will never have to use. The Scottish Government is right to pay tribute to what it describes as the brave and dedicated men and women of Scotland's emergency services. They are there for us 24 hours a day, each and every day of the year. They don't ask for praise or recognition. They just do their job and, by God, they do it exceptionally well. And the Cabinet Secretary is right to mention the contribution of emergency services to the Ryder Cup and the Commonwealth Games. But in a sense, that passes without comment because there was no serious incident. And unfortunately, we only focus on what the emergency services do when there is an emergency or a disaster. And tragically, this can happen all too often. Sometimes it's through malice, sometimes neglect, sometimes accidents, and sometimes it's a force of nature. I can think back to the Lockerbie tragedy, human destruction in Scotland caused by an evil attack on a scale we have never seen in recent times. The response from our emergency services was swift, thorough and professional, and it must have been harrowing for all those who had to respond. In Glasgow, over the years, we have witnessed a number of devastating fires, leading to major loss of life, including fire service personnel. And it's fitting that the fire service still remembers their comrades who lost their lives. And we saw again the professionalism of the fire service in the Stockline disaster, a disaster caused by neglect. And I know Patricia Ferguson will speak about this. And in the space of just over 12 months, Glasgow again witnessed two horrific events that will live with us for a long, long time. It was our emergency services who had to respond to the dreadful consequences of the bin lorry crash in Glasgow just before Christmas. And just over a year ago, when the police helicopter crashed into the Clutha Vaults pub, all of our emergency services 
responded magnificently. They worked tirelessly for three days in difficult and dangerous conditions, including have to having to tunnel through rubble to help victims trapped at the scene. Fire Service Area Commander Paul Conley was right to speak of his pride following his crew's bravery in the face of what he described as a truly harrowing scene. And that's what's worth repeating about all of our emergency services. It's not just their dedication and commitment. It's often their bravery. The bravery of ambulance staff at the Clutha Vaults incident was also recognised, including the contribution of Watch Commander Stuart English, based in Paisley, who normally covers my constituency. He escaped from the crash scene. Sorry, Stuart was off duty, enjoying a night out at the Clutha. And he escaped from the crash scene, but went back in with members of the public to attempt to locate and rescue those trapped. Like other emergency workers, they are never truly off duty, but always ready to spring into action if required. And it's also worth recognising that in these two tragedies, as well as in others, the public responded magnificently in support of our emergency services. And the tales of bravery of police officers are also legion. The police are our frontline protection in towns and cities when drunken behaviour often spills over into violence. They are there to protect the public when very occasionally a minority acts violently at major events or demonstrations. They are the ones who have to step up to the plate when, the light, when lives are threatened in firearm or knife incidents. They step in when arguments get out of hand and lead to violence. Last year saw the launch of a book Beyond the Call of Duty, and it featured an incident involving officers from Police Scotland. PCs Craig McCall, Brian Manchester and Andy Kindle were attacked by a man wielding a samurai sword, leaving PC Craig McCall seriously injured. And it's not just attacks, presiding officer, which endanger life. Last year, PC Tony Ann Ewart rightly received a bravery award from the First Minister for risking her life to save the life of a man who attempted to jump from the top floor of a multi-storey car park. And the problem in one sense for this debate is that there are just too many examples to be able to list every single act of bravery and dedication. And let's not forget our staff at accident and emergency who then have to cope with the consequences of accidents and disaster. As we know from recent press reports, they work under extremely, dangerous, uh, extremely difficult conditions. They have to cope with large number of patients and the system is creaking even without any major incidents. But cope they do. And despite the pressures, they too do their best for those that they serve. But it would be wrong to suggest that emergency services stop and start with the police, fire, ambulance and accident and emergency. Over the last few months, we have been starkly reminded of the power of what is sometimes described as a cruel sea. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned, mentioned this month's loss of the cargo vessel at Chemifjord with the loss of eight crew members, and that was a stark reminder of the power and the danger of the sea, as was the battering which the Spanish fishing trawler took last month during the recent so-called weather bomb, or the threats to the lives of the crew of the disabled fish carrier Norholm caused by a force-seven gale and Atlantic storm off Cape Wrath. As is expected of them, the Coast Guards responded unhesitatingly. But so too did the brave volunteers of the RNLI, which operates 47 stations in Scotland. It's a voluntary organisation which depends on the contribution of the public. And in all of these incidents, these brave volunteers were on hand to do their bit to save lives. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has rightly commended the work of our mountain rescue services, and I defer to his greater knowledge and experience. But I, too, want to pay tribute to their heroism and bravery. We have 27 volunteer teams involving 1,000 volunteers to back up the three police teams and the one RAF team. And already this month, they have been in action helping to save lives, and I've no doubt there will be further demands on them over the winter. And over the last few months, we have also seen the dedication of power supply workers who have battled to restore supplies 
in fierce condi weather conditions. So, presiding officer, there is a common theme running through the stories of staff and volunteers. Heroism, bravery, dedication, selflessness. As I've said before, they don't ask for praise or recognition, but I'm sure it's nice when it comes, whether through bravery awards or opportunities like this, to put our thanks on the record. But you know, presiding officer, while they won't ask for it, perhaps there is a responsibility on all of us collectively in this parliament to reflect and consider whether we owe them more than warm words. Do we ever give them the opportunity to come to us and tell us what it is really like on the front line? Why don't we give them the chance to brief this parliament on their work, their successes and the pressures they face? Should we not repay their dedication by saying that we will look at the resilience and resourcing of our emergency services? The saying goes that talk is cheap. Well, today we have the chance to do more than talk and offer warm words. We have the chance to say to these brave men and women, thank you and well done. But also, come and talk to us and tell us how we can help to improve what you do. We know the outcomes are lives saved, but we also know that in doing this, you are putting your lives on the line. So the least that we can do is listen. What have we got to fear in listening to these fearless heroes? That's why, presiding officer, I'm moving my amendment calling for a parliamentary inquiry. Let's give a voice to these brave men and women. Let's listen to their stories and let's pledge that we will repay their efforts by making sure that we do what we can to make sure that they are ready and equipped to face whatever is thrown at them. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Jackson Carlow to speak to move amendment number 12060.1. Mr Carlow, about seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And can I immediately move the amendment in my name, as I'm sure to forget to do that uh, as debate progresses. Can I endorse uh, really everything that I think that the Cabinet Secretary had to say and Mr Henry had to say in terms of the scope, scale, range of services in which I think we have such confidence and pride. Um, the extraordinary efforts of so many across Scotland, always without fuss or celebrity, the hallmark, I think, being the professional, exemplary and compassionate way they go about the job that they do. And I made the small but I, I think slightly significant uh, amendment in my name for one reason only. It was because struck by the events uh, last week in Paris and shocked as I think we all were uh, and reflecting that really our history is peppered with incidents like that. They are always very much of the moment but we can go back a hundred years and find that there were similar examples of incidents where uh, services were brought to bear on behalf of the public, that we depend in very large part on an anonymous body of people, those who provide the intelligence which potentially can prevent these atrocities from happening in the first place. Um, and in that regard, at GCHQ in Cheltenham, uh, the United Kingdom, in an operation peppered with Scots, uh, and so many Scots assisting in the provision of services which are vital to the protection of the public beyond the boundaries of Scotland itself. Uh, we have at GCHQ a world-leading operation in the gathering of intelligence, which is not just keeping us safe in this country, which is recognized to be contributing to intelligence, which is keeping people safe way beyond. And we will never probably know who these people are. We can only really thank them in absentia. Their, his their history began, of course, um, at Bletchley Park. That, that is where our tradition of intelligence began. And by coincidence, I noticed that a book has just been published this week, The Bletchley Girls, Secrecy, Love and Loss, The Women of Bletchley Park Tell Their Story. And I was impressed to find quite a few Scots still living who were among the number who were responsible for providing that intelligence and security, including a constituent of mine, Lady Jean Ford in the Isle of Arran, who was in Hut 8 with Alan Turing. Um, uh, whom she talks of fondly, uh, providing vital intelligence which saved lives throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. Indeed, she amusingly relates, first of all, that that work is incredibly dull, repetitive, 
and actually at the coalface unrewarding because you very often don't know what you have discovered that others will interpret. But she said in that, uh, and I was amused by the incident, one uh, German who was coding thing, unfortunately, so uber loyal was he, he signed every communication, Heil Hitler, which of course was a magnificent uh, way of decrypting everything he then gone on to say, uh, which I'm sure wasn't quite the intention. But the, I want to thank her. I, I've met her. I had no idea because the hallmark of many of the people who in these less publicly aware uh, capacities has been that they are so unassuming about the contribution they have made, make no fuss or mention of it. And again, I say it is only through thanking them in absentia that we can probably do justice to all that they do. Now, there are a whole long list of people that we could talk about. There are the armed forces, of course, who assist in so many ways, uh, whether it be in uh, uh, adding to the, con the complement of those who kept people visiting this country safe during the Commonwealth Games or who are called upon when uh, a, a, an unexploded or a bomb is discovered or a suspected device is, con is discovered. There are animal health people who, of course, suddenly come to the fore when there is a, a, a crisis in, in that field. There are, I think, as Hugh Henry touched upon, those who are actually not in the emergency service but in whom the public depend in the public utilities and telecommunications and transport who step in with the same hallmark of professionalism, very often at great inconvenience to themselves and way beyond anything they wouldn't naturally have had to do. I mean, we only have to think back again to the Isle of Arran two or three winters ago to remember just how paralysed that community was by the weather that came and the extent to which they totally depended upon the efforts of people who stepped forward to try and restore services, which again were thereafter keeping people safe on that island. More recently, of course, uh, when the First Minister had to take hold of the uh, incident in relation to Ebola, we depended upon the Royal Free Hospital in London to step in uh, because it is the UK resource centre for providing the services that are necessary. Uh, and, of course, as we know, um, that situation is still ongoing. But I did point out uh, over the recess that despite all of this, there is an underbelly which is not always quite so attractive. Six times a day, somebody in Scotland thinks it worth their while uh, to make a hoax call calling out an ambulance crew. Six times a day. Uh, somewhere in Scotland, somebody thinks that's a worthwhile pastime. And any of us who've made an, a 999 call know it's quite a sophisticated process now. Uh, you actually, there are qualifying questions. So those people who make hoax calls go to quite an elaborate uh, degree to maintain the fiction which then wastes the time of those who are called out. Very often a hoax is only apparent at the point when the services present themselves um, at where the incident is alleged to be. And I think really we have to be much more robust and prepared to be much more robust because that is a completely unacceptable uh, waste of public resource. And when you see, as we did at George Square or uh, in other incidents that have been referred to, just how much we depend upon the dedication and commitment of those individuals when a genuine emergency is in place. It is simply and totally unacceptable that they should be called out and that their time should be wasted or that they should be frankly abused in that way by people uh, who uh, exist in society. And I, I know we will all share that view, sometimes harder to know how to deal with it, but we should be prepared to. Presiding officer, the other point I made uh, in the aftermath of that was there has to be a responsible use of social media in all that we see in terms of keeping Scotland safe going forward. Uh, I am concerned it can be a terrific tool for ensuring that people know what they need to know, but it has to be used please. responsibly. If people don't know anything, they should keep quiet and they should realise that an incident is not an entertainment. It is something quite distinct. And I think it's very important because I think social media is going to play an increasing role in the future that it's used responsibly. But on behalf of Scottish Conservatives, presiding officer, we are very happy to support the motion. We believe that it is a very worthwhile motion to put before Parliament, and I know that Parliament will be united in making clear to all of those in the emergency service. I don't know that bringing them through here to which, watch our debate would be a sort of inspiring vote of thanks that we'd be looking for, but I know that we would wish them that, and we should, as Hugh Henry said, ensure that they receive the resources that are necessary to undertake their function. Thanks so much. And we now move to open debate. 
uh, speeches of six minutes or thereby. I call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Dr Elaine Murray. President officer, I'm pleased to speak in this debate with a, and I have a particular focus on voluntary emergency services. And part of the reason for this is that for many years I was a volunteer firefighter and I can therefore claim some insight into the value, valuable work undertaken by these volunteers. And nearly 30 years ago now, I was one of the members of a newly formed volunteer unit, which had the distinction of being the first in Scotland to include female firefighters. And it will come as no surprise, I'm sure, to anyone here to learn that the women in the unit performed the roles every bit as effectively as the men. And Strathclyde Fire Service, as they were called then, were rightly proud of this pioneering initiative. And they provided first-class training and backup. And importantly, they didn't use the volunteer service as an excuse to downgrade the professional service. Around the same time, they upgraded the Oban station from a facility operated by retained firefighters to one operated by whole time crews. And a few years later, they built a new and a much better station. And over the years, we dealt with many serious fires, including one in which there was a fatality, a man who was a, a friend and a neighbour. And I know now that in some areas of the Highlands and Islands, fire services are being threatened because of difficulties in recruiting volunteer and retained firefighters. And I would strongly recommend that men and women take up these opportunities to serve their communities in such a practical way. I found my experience very rewarding and very interesting. So, President Officer, I'd like to take the opportunity of paying a tribute to the many volunteer firefighters who contribute such a lot to their communities across the Highlands and Islands and beyond. And I'm very aware, as a result of my experience, of the dangers of fire and of how dependent we are when disaster strikes on the skills and courage of our firefighters. But I'd also like to pay a, pay a tribute to the Coast Guard Service, another organisation that relies on volunteers. Less than two weeks ago now, we learned of the loss of the cargo ship, the, the Semfjord, as a stark reminder of how dangerous the sea can be, a stark reminder of how suddenly disaster can strike at sea and of how powerless we are at times when it does strike. And it's at these times, in daylight and often in darkness, in ferocious and terrifying conditions, that we see our community of mariners and their friends ashore honour that ancient obligation to come to the aid of those in distress at sea. And as an islander myself, I've witnessed this all too often. I've participated in rescues. I've lost good friends to the sea. I've witnessed firsthand, on more than one occasion, the distress of bereaved families. And I've seen skippers and crews put to sea in rescue efforts, in weather that makes me shudder to think of it. And I owe my own life to such courageous people to the crew of a fishing boat who found me on a night of such wicked weather that the lifeboat had to turn back. On a night where the wind was so strong that the helicopter that finally rescued me had to delay the rescue for several hours. I should mention that the skipper of that fishing boat was sadly lost at sea himself a few years later. And it's because of this, presiding officer, that I'm angry. Angry beyond words, or at least any words that would be suitable in this chamber, at the UK government's cuts to the Coast Guard service. At a time when both recreational and commercial use of our sea is increasing, this is surely unacceptable. And it's only those that live such cosseted lives that they're wholly unaware of the conditions routinely braved by those at sea who could contemplate such cuts. It's only those who have no appreciation or understanding of the Highlands and Islands of Scotland who could consider this. Presiding officer, I don't believe there's a single member of this chamber who would condone 
such cuts. I don't believe a Scottish government of any political hue would make such cuts. And I don't believe that those who advocate austerity fully consider that we'll pay for this fatally flawed economic policy in lives lost at sea and on land. Thanks very much. I now call on Dr Elaine Murray to be followed by Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. At the time this uh, debate was scheduled, none of us could have foreseen the dreadful events that were to unfold in Paris at the end of last week. These demonstrate the extreme dangers which the public can face and the burden placed on those public servants whose job is, it is to keep the public safe. Responsibilities which can cost their lives. A price which was tragically paid by Parisian police officers Ahmed Mirabe, Frank Brunson-Loro and Clarissa Jean-Philippe last week. The frontline duties of the emergency services, such as Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, routinely put themselves at risk as they seek to minimise damage to life and property. The Glasgow School of Art, for example, would have suffered considerably worse damage had it not been for the heroic efforts of 120 firefighters who fought the blaze for over seven hours on the 23rd of May last year. And of course, we are all relieved to learn that the life of heroic nurse Paula Kafferke is now out of danger, though her recovery process will take some time. Not only did Paula risk her life to help Ebola victims in West Africa, in joining, joining the effort to control the disease, she was also protecting us here. As President Obama said back in October, the best way to tackle Ebola and to prevent it spent spreading across the world is to contain the disease and to fo focus its efforts through aid in the provision of health workers to combat it in the countries in West Africa in which are affected. In this season of poor weather, we should also pay tribute to the workers who battle to keep our roads and railways functioning and those who work often in horrendous conditions to try to restore power supplies to homes uh, without power often in remote, remote areas. And as others have said, there are many others who risk their, their own safety, protect and to rescue uh, others. Uh, often volunteers, make, mention has been made uh, already of the Mountain Rescue Service. Uh, in my own constituency, the Moffat Mountain Rescue Service uh, perform an invaluable service. And indeed, the Galloway Mountain Rescue Service to the west of us only last week rescued a walker on Merrick who got into difficulty. Often these volunteers are called upon to risk their lives in challenging and hostile environments to save climbers and walkers who have not taken the correct precautions or equipment. Nevertheless, they continue to make themselves available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, to take these risks in, the, in their own time to serve others. Other speakers have also mentioned people such as the Coast Guards and the men and women of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, whose courage and dedication have helped seafarers in trouble since the early 19th century. I'd like to make mention of the Nith Inshore Rescue Team, based, based in Glen Capel in my constituency, which provides a voluntary search and rescue service covering the Nith estuary and the rivers and lochs in the area. The crew are all unpaid volunteers. Like their mountain rescue counterparts, they are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they were worthy recipients of the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service in 2010. They play a, a role when uh, we have incidents of flooding, which is well known uh, in our area, and I should also acknowledge the SEPA Floodline Service, despite the fact that they called me at 3am and at 6am this morning to advise me that my office might be going to be flooded again. Fortunately, it wasn't. And while acknowledging and celebrating the bravery of both frontline emergency workers and volunteers who risk injury, disease and death in the course of their duties, we must also recommend, remember the contribution of those who support them and who take calls from the members of the public in distress, the staff working in the control rooms of the emergency services. Unfortunately, these staff have been at the sharp end of service cuts recently. The numbers of civilian police staff posts fell by 2056 between March 2010 and June 2014. Police and fire and rescue services so control rooms in Dumfries have recently closed. The police control room in, uh, closed in May and uh, the last message from that control room was a very moving message about how much they had enjoyed protecting their frontline workers over the period of their work. The fire and rescue uh, control uh, has uh, closed in Nove uh, November last year and unfortunately we lost staff with many years experience in keeping us safe and in keeping frontline workers in emergency service services safe. So I think we also need to celebrate and recognise the contribution of our control staff to the majority of which are women. 
The FRS are cur currently in the process of merging the eight fire control rooms into three. And the best means of demonstrating our gratitude and that our recognition is meaningful is by ensuring that these new control rooms are safe and continue to deliver this level of service our communities have enjoyed by staffing them to a level that delivers this safety. And I will ask the Scottish Government to confirm that staffing levels will be sufficient with the appropriate balance of supervision and that it will agree initial staffing levels with the FBUS. On a positive note, the National Centre for Resilience in Scotland is to be established in Dumfries and Galloway, at, uh, sorry, in Dumfries at the Crichton campus, uh, to improve the response to issues such as flooding and to coordinate work on the preparation for an increase in severe weather, uh, which is anticipated, of course, uh, as a consequence or one of the consequences of climate change. And I look forward, uh, as ministers know, to learning more about the establishment, that how it will operate, and uh, which organisations will be taking part in that. As Hugh Henry said, Labour's amendment makes reference to the resources required to maintain resilience, resources which can be called on very suddenly and without warning. We ask Parliament to take responsibility for supporting those who keep us safe by ensuring that the necessary resources are available, by asking the statutory and voluntary organisations who provide these services what it is that they need, how the vital tasks they undertake may be made easier. By all means, let's record our gratitude to emergency workers across Scotland and beyond. But our actions in their support are even more important and we should demonstrate our commitment by providing the support that they need. Many thanks. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Alison McInnes. Six minutes or thereby, we have a little time in hand. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And in this relatively consensual debate, I regret that I've got to take Hugh Henry to task for the Labour amendment. As I quote, it asks the Parliament, quotes, to agree that the Justice and Health and Sport Committee should lead, close quotes, this in relation to any inquiry into the resilience of the emergency services. Now, quite apart from the fact that Hugh Henry should know in his new portfolio that the forward work programme for the Justice Committee is crammed and got little space for anything, there's a more basic objection to this. During his, and indeed mine, unsuccessful bid to presiding officer, I recall him then, and actually quite regularly and quite rightly, banging on about the independence of Parliament's committees and how they should be masters of their own agenda. So I cannot agree that any committee should take any direction from the Parliament or anybody else about what they do on their agendas. So for that reason, and that reason alone in the first place, I don't think anyone should support the Labour amendment. It interferes with the independence of committees to decide their own agendas. I think it was an oversight, Mr Henry, but I think it's wrong. Now on the substantive issues, I want to tell the Chamber a couple of stories to illustrate for me how practical and unseen the cooperation is between our emergency services. A few years back, I was out in police patrol in the borders, thankfully before health and safety interfered and sanitised any meaningful participation by an MSP. We went on several potential, to several potential crime scenes, all of which were very diverse, but one which stands out because I had my eyes opened in a very practical way to the value of our services. A woman had jumped from Lawson Bridge in Hoyk into the Teviot. It was night and the river was low. She'd fallen on the rocks. Blue light going, I'm not permitted to travel this way now unless I'm under arrest. We arrived to meet police cordoning off the road. The fire brigade was already there, roped up, and they were climbing over the rocks into the water. And the ambulance and the paramedics were also already down there, wading in the shallows with the emergency silver foil blanket. The thing that struck me, no one needed to explain what they were about, what they were doing. They didn't really need to say much. Seamlessly, they knew their role, how to make sure this poor woman was rescued and taken to hospital as soon as possible. The second story relates to a woman who fell from a platform into the path of an oncoming train. This comes from my previous life as a solicitor. I kept it fairly anonymous. Trapped beneath the train, fire and rescue and paramedics crawled under it, hot oil dripping on them. And when the train began to move because the driver was still in shock, somehow they managed to get them to hold the train still. Not because they were there lying there, but because the wheels were actually acting as a tourniquet on the woman's legs and stopping her from bleeding to death. She survived. Now, these two stories brought home to me 
the reality, you know, in living flesh and blood of what they deal with every day as the cabinet secretary referred to. I couldn't do their jobs. I wouldn't sleep at night. Some politicians don't sleep at night for different reasons. But I would not be able to do that and take these images with me. And these are day-to-day -day images. Especially with firefighters, I think, in the news with dreadful events, the public at large tend to forget that a lot of their work is at road traffic accidents, cutting the injured or the dead free. Or the police and the ambulance workers in attendance, the medics administering on the spot crammed into wrecked vehicles, life-saving interventions. But again, all working together in a cohesive and mutually respectful society. There are no silos there. There are no professional, uh, professional policies that have to be put in place. They know what to do. They make way for each other when it is needed. Now, in the borders roads in particular, this is very important because it's got a bad record, like many rural roads for traffic accidents, in particular motorcycle accidents, huge amount, 23% of all deaths and serious injuries on the borders roads over the past five years, well above the national average. Ten have lost their lives in the years that have just passed, and most of them are over 35. Nobody imagine how often fire and rescue, police and ambulance are called to these scenes, and they all deserve a recognition. So while some hit the headlines, these are happening, regrettably, daily across Scotland. But we must also recognise that the emergency services are not always called to duty in horrific circumstances. I'm thinking of the various ridings that take place across the borders or the agricultural shows where you see the police wandering about, you see the Red Cross with their van. They've been involved at the very beginning in the planning of the event. They're there at the time to make sure if anything untoward happens, there's a horse riding accident or so on, they're on the spot, somebody fainting. They are there, busy doing their job. So we have a lot to be grateful to them for. I'm going to finish on a less serious story because I had the fire uh, brigade turned up at my cottage once many years ago when my lum went up Boxing Day. It was a lovely snowy day. My floors were polished. The house was lovely. They all knew me. They were local men. They were laughing, I'm afraid, as they came in. I hen, you've set fire to your lum. They, put, they had to put a hole in the wall to stop. See, it wasn't going up the chimney. My house was soaking wet. I was bursting into tears. The children thought it was wonderful. All dancing in front of the fire engine. Are you coming out to get your picture taken with the fire engine? You can understand why I just sat in the house crying. But I was grateful they turned up anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I gladly join members across the Chamber in commending all those who work in so many different ways to keep us safe. My Liberal Democrat colleagues and I are incredibly grateful for the work the emergency services do for all our constituents around Scotland. Police officers, ambulance crews, firefighters, doctors, nurses, and many, many more routinely put the needs of the public before their own. Each time they start a shift, they are prepared to deal with unexpected, distressing and traumatic situations. Incidents the rest of us might never encounter at all and certainly hope that we don't. Others have already spoken about the tragic event that occurred in central Glasgow before Christmas. And I note that the family of Jack and Lorraine Sweeney and their granddaughter Erin McQuaid yesterday publicly thanked those who attended to their loved ones and have provided assistance since the weeks since, including the emergency services. And by all accounts, the multi-agency response to this awful incident was absolutely exemplary. But responding to such events can be physically and emotionally draining, and we should acknowledge that. And the appalling events in Paris last week also remind us that some sadly lose their lives in the course of their work. Such selfless bravery. Presiding officer, countless volunteers are also immensely important in keeping our communities safe and protecting our health. They can be found assisting people in every part of Scotland, from the high street to the highest mountain peaks and the roughest seas. Volunteers are the backbone of our lifeboat crews and mountain rescue teams. Police special constables bring a wealth of local knowledge. And as Mike Mackenzie pointed out, many parts of Scotland, including my North East region, depend heavily on retained and volunteer firefighters. They make up 40% of Scotland's firefighters and provide cover for 90% of the country's landmass, much of it rural or remote. Volunteers gain new skills and they are rewarded with unique experiences and the satisfaction of being able to help others. But ultimately, 
They selflessly give their time and expertise for little or no recompense, and they combine rigorous training and varied deployments with work and family life, and we owe them a debt of gratitude for that. In the spirit of Jackson Carlaw's more expansive amendment, I would like to take a moment to thank the engineers who have been working to reinstate connections in the past week, often amid atrocious conditions. Uh, removing trees from train tracks, restoring light and warmth to our homes, they too provide services that are vital, particularly to the most vulnerable in our society. And of course, those who drive our gritters and snow ploughs to make the roads safer for the rest of us, up and out in conditions that most of us fear to drive in. Now, as the amendment from Hugh Henry suggests, members' praise and warm words are not enough. It is our responsibility to ensure that our services have the resources that they need. And we know that services are under intense pressure. As individual MSPs and in our committee work, we regularly receive evidence to this effect from professionals on the front line, independent observers, unions and scrutiny bodies. For example, the Chief Officer of the Fire and Rescue Service told the Justice Committee last year of long-standing problems with the system of retained firefighters. And the Scottish Secretary of the FBU said it was on its knees. The Chief Inspector of Constabulary reported in October to the committee that the morale of police officers and staff had been affected by the pace and nature of the change to Police Scotland. And he said many are unsure as to their role or future within the organisation. Today we learn of the number of police officers taking stress-related sick leave has risen by more than a quarter since the establishment of the National Force. And we know that accident and emergency departments are currently struggling to cope with exceptionally high levels of demand. The director of the RCN in Scotland, Theresa Fife, remarked that the whole system is creaking at the seams. And the last few weeks have seen a perfect storm of conditions that demonstrate just how perilous the state of the NHS is. Do we need an inquiry? I agree with Christine Graham. I think it's up to the committees to answer that. I do know, though, that the real challenge for the Scottish Government and for ourselves as members of Parliament is to listen and respond constructively to these professionals and experts when they tell us the truth, to be open and fair with them, to be willing to shift resources and priorities accordingly. At times like this, at times this Parliament will disagree on how best to achieve that, but no one should ever suggest that properly scrutinising justice or health or any other policy area is indicative of a lack of respect or support for the personnel on the front line. Indeed, I think it demonstrates quite the opposite, and anything less would be doing them a disservice. Services work around the clock to keep us safe in all circumstances and in all weather, and in return they deserve our heartfelt thanks, but they also require our assistance and support. Thank you very much. I now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Hans Alan Malik. I'll just uh, alert the Chamber to the fact that there is a little time in hand for intervention, even anecdotes. So, Mr Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, although I do not represent a Glasgow seat, like most of Scotland, I cannot but fail to have noted the way that that city, its people and its emergency services have responded to very real emergencies in the past 13 months at the Clutha Bar and George Square. All of us, when a crisis occurs, depend on the professionalism, bravery and integrity of those services to help cope with the di distressing situations that occur. But if I may, perhaps I can begin by reminding members that Scotland has a vast coastline adjoining a sea which can often be very cruel, as Mike McKenzie has vividly uh, re recounted to us this afternoon. Events such as the loss of all hands on the cement carrier Kement Ford in the North Sea remind us of the dangers of working at sea. And although I'm not contending it would have made a difference in this situation, the demise of Nimrad aircraft, formerly based at Murray, meant, of course, that there was one less potential search and rescue facility available. Our Coast Guard service, however, provides vital support. Despite the UK government's plan to reduce the number of maritime rescue coordination centres, Aberdeen MRCC, covering an area from Brora Sutherland to the Scottish-English border, has a vital role and has endured, unfortunately, critical understaffing levels recently. But it still provides a professional service in the face of adversity. I know that I am not alone in considering the closure of Coast Guard services across Scotland at both Fife Ness and the Clyde, one of the many mistakes of this coalition government. Of course, emergency responses would be much less effective without the support of the army of volunteers that selflessly give their valuable time to help those in distress. 
The RNLI is well known as an emergency service that provides a high-quality, life-saving service reliant on volunteers. It's a valuable asset to this country and indeed to the United Kingdom that many owe their lives to. With an average of 23 call-outs a day, there's most likely a lifeboat out on a rescue right now. The Cabinet Secretary has referred to the number of the lifeboat stations around the coast. In my own constituency, RNL Ein Anstruther, covering the Firth of Forth and the North Sea, is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. With only one score plus of seagoing crew, they sacrificed many hours of personal time spent on rescue operations, exercising and, of course, maintaining the station and lifeboat. Away from the sea, our mountain rescue service is another body reliant on volunteers. As the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned, providing a priceless army of volunteer hours is more than worthy of mention, as are, of course, the staff and dogs of SADA, the Search and Rescue Dog Association, who regularly assist them. Scottish mountain rescue teams regularly go into the mountains in what can be an unforgiving environment at any time of year. Team members drop everything to react to the phone call that can come at any time, often causing them to undertake long and dangerous rescues. The sacrifices made by these volunteers should not be underestimated, nor indeed unappreciated. The same could be said of our fire and rescue service. Our firefighters have had a good year, with 28% fewer deaths caused by fire compared to last year, and this was partially due to the lowest ever number of house fires. Over 71,000 house visits were conducted nationwide. In North East Fife alone, the number of home fire safety visits conducted last year was 50% greater than in the previous year, and more than had taken place in any previous year. Coupling that with more installations of telecare and hard-of-hearing smoke alarms in partnership with NHS Fife, at Fife Social Service and Fife Social Services, shows, in my opinion, that there is a real correlation between community engagement, increased personal safety, and reduction in casualties caused by fires. Presiding officer, we're already into the third week of the new year. While some of us may have been reveling and merrily bringing in the new year, the Scottish Ambulance Service was having its busiest night of the year. On Hogmanay, 2,394 calls at a rate of 250 an hour from midnight to 7 a.m. were attended to. More often than not, the paramedics on call were dealing with those under the influence of alcohol and enduring threats of or an actual physical attacks. We clearly must continue efforts to stamp out this sort of behaviour against our emergency services. Our ambulance service is also ably assisted by first responder units. These are yet more volunteers in communities throughout the country who have in several cases been responsible for the installation and education in, in, in the use of public access defibrillators. In towns and villages everywhere, I know of at least 20 in North East Fife, in the East Nuke part of North East Fife alone. I'm also aware that the Scottish Government is working on a national strategy for out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, and I'm meeting with the Ambulance Service tomorrow to address this further in the context of how it may affect first responders in my own constituency. If I may, I may finish by referring to our police service. Scotland's national police force has been referred to in this chamber at great length in recent years. We know that police numbers have increased over the last seven years, whilst those south of the border have fallen very significantly. Fear of crime is now falling to historic lows in Scotland. Police participation in the emergency services is, of course, well known. Some criticism has been levied that the creation of a single police force has led to less community engagement by local police officers. Last Friday, I met with Chief Superintendent Gary McEwen of P Division of Police Scotland in Fife. Fife is currently running a pilot scheme that started this Monday in which two community ward police officers are allocated to every single council ward in the local authority. And indeed, I'm, next Friday, I'm meeting with the uh, ward police officers in my patch. I wish this new scheme well. While it's not specifically geared to emergencies, I have no doubt that it will not be very long before the officers concerned are in an emergency situation. In conclusion, presiding officer, emergency services have been necessary yesterday, today, yesterday, today and will be in the future. Let's all recognise their amazing contribution and the debt we owe the emergency services. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now call on Hans Ala Malik to be followed by Colin Beattie. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. May I first say I do not only want to thank all Blue Light Services, but all uniform services for their contribution in providing a 24-7 service across the board for providing emergency support. However, sometimes we are guilty of taking Scottish emergency services for granted. Our emergency services are a credit to our country, and we should all be thankful for their hard work, commitment, 
throughout the year, especially over the festive period when sometimes work, working away from families would be necessary. In my city of Glasgow, we have had our fair share of disasters, which unite us in sadness and grief, but which also unite us in a very heartfelt sympathy for those affected <laughs> by the troubled, troubled events. And a night of the bin lorry accident also unites us in support for the excellent job done by the emergency services who have worked tirelessly in just a few minutes one afternoon, a scene where celebrations, festival lights in George Square turned to disaster and despair. Yet amongst, almost immediately, the first volunteers were on the scene and also our emergency services, attending, bringing compassion, skill, and dedication. I feel the pain and the burden carried in the hearts by those who have lost loved ones. Please note our NHS is in readiness for Ambola and reacting to the Glasgow bin lorry accident and the Glasgow helicopter crash events. Have recovered, have registered that Scotland has heroes in its emergency services that are organized and well equipped and ready to react to any emergency. I want to go further to thank all those charities that swing into action when there is a disaster or an emergency which needs their special skills. The charity Glasgow the Caring City was on hand when the Stockhill plastic factory suffered a gas explosion, killing nine and injuring over 33 people. The charity provided fresh water, blankets, and one-to-one -one comforting to relatives and friends, jointly with Glasgow Community Central Hall's Muriel Road, another charity. And at the Glasgow airport attack, Glasgow Caring City once again provided similar support. And during the helicopter crash at the pub, Glasgow Central Mosque opened its doors to support and serve uh, service provision facilities as well as hospitality. In national troubles, when local services can't cope, then the armed forces step in and are frequently called upon to support emergency services. I feel that while pressure is on our emergency services, we can never be more generous in, in justifying their good wishes and support. We must, always th we should, we must al also thank volunteers, charities, and donors involved in emergency occasions. Providing officer, I have to say more that emergency events show a growing dependency on volunteers and charities. Whilst this is very welcome to support our services, which should not, but it should not be happening as a routine. And I genuinely believe that reliance on such uh, charities and goodwill of people means that the emergency services may start depending on them. I suggest an, uh, a parliament inquiry ought to be done to see uh, if there is a need for additional resources so that that can be addressed before any civilians or citizens are let down. Now, Christine Graham was very brave to give the cabinet secretary a public warning and saying that you know they're a very busy committee and they don't want to do any more work. But I have to say to the, the cabinet secretary, that whilst I appreciate the fact that she is uh, a, a very busy committee, people come first. And if we can save one additional life, it's worth the additional work and the burden. Therefore, I can't emphasize strongly enough that whilst we have got the police and the fire services joined up and serving the people of Scotland, I think an assessment is very important to see that how we've achieved and what we've achieved during the past year or so. I, like many other members, have served in the Special Constabulary, I've served in the Territorial Army, and I did a, a fire protection firefighting course myself. So I'm aware of the, the difficulties that you face on the ground. And I think, therefore, it is absolutely essential 
that whilst we have given our fire services and police services responsibilities to try and achieve the impossible at some times, I think we need to show them some reality and responsibility in ensuring that we can support them in carrying out their tasks in a managed way, in a controlled way, in which they are not looking for handouts or they're not looking for people who may be in place to assist them at any given time. I think to rely on public goodwill at all occasions is a dangerous thing to be doing, and therefore I can't emphasize enough that a parliamentary inquiry would, I believe, be of benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call on Colin Beatty to be followed by Graham Day. A generous six minutes. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to comment on and to commend the people who keep Scotland safe in emergencies. We've seen many recent examples of catastrophic situations which emergency services have dealt with in an exemplary fashion, from the recent horrific events in Paris to the rather less dramatic but unforeseen and very real human crises in my own constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh. Disasters are created by both nature and humans, and to be involved in the emergency services demands a remarkably wide variety of skills and frequently a degree of courage and ingenuity. Even with these skills, the members of emergency services teams often respond to situations at great personal risk and do so to ensure safety and to minimise human cost and property damage. Indeed, the emergency teams of Scotland deserve our praise and, and admiration. Last month, emergency services responded to the dramatic bin lorry crash in Glasgow, and this emergency, unlike the recent events in France, was no plan planned act of terror, but apparently a horrific accident as a bin lorry careered out of control and crashed. And as we know, this tragedy resulted in six dead and ten injured. Such emergencies don't call for armed force response as did the shootings in Paris, and instead the emergency services were seen battling to save the lives of injured people on the street. The different branches of emergency services work quickly and cohesively together as police, medics and firefighters all played their part in ensuring the least amount of damage would be done as they conducted rescue operations. And this is an example of the unstinting effort given by members of Scotland's emergency services following an accident that can only be described as heartbreaking for those affected. A year prior to that, in the same city of Glasgow, disaster struck as a helicopter crashed into a local pub. The crash led to many of the occupants of the pub being trapped in the building that was damaged and in danger of collapse. This tragedy demonstrates some of the complexities that our emergency services can face. The response from the local firefighting team displayed a mixture of skills and ingenuity with dozens trapped in this unstable building. The firefighters were able to act cautiously but quickly to extract those who were trapped. Additional precautions had to be taken because of the danger of the collapse and the process wasn't easy. But in the end, lives were saved because of the fire brigade's ability to act swiftly, analyse and plan. And the reaction by the response teams to this emergency serves as a testimony to the breadth of the skills of our emergency services men and women. In my own constituency, there have been similar acts of bravery from our response teams, and, th and these highlight the tireless and commendable work of our emergency services. In Musselburgh on Christmas Eve, uh, an act of vandalism occurred as an attempt was made to set fire to a salon in the city's high street, and the swift response to the police service underscores the commitment essential for any emergency team to display. At a time of year when many of us were enjoying our holiday recess with our families, the officers of Police Scotland in the area were called to the scene and quickly began the search to find those responsible. For the men and women of our emergency services, there is no downtime, and someone is on duty all the time. We have strong and experienced police, medical and firefighting teams, but we must not forget that we have over 10,000 miles of Scottish coastline and the dedicated Coast Guard teams that protect and preserve that vast coastline and its beaches. My own constituency is home to the Fisherow Coast Guard Rescue Team. Fisherow in Musselburgh contains the Fisherow Sands, which is a beach area used for recreational activities by many throughout the year. And interestingly, as part of their role, the Coast Guard team answers calls to attend distressed and despondent persons who may be in need of assistance, an aspect of the work of emergency services that usually goes unnoticed. Caring for wounds and other physical damage is critical in situations that call for emergency services, but we must not forget this other facet of their job. Calls to help and assist distressed or depressed people come often to emergency services, and physical catastrophes 
are often accompanied by psychological ones. Members of emergency services teams must be prepared and trained to attend to the psychological issues as well as the physical. The work of the Fisher Road Coast Guard Rescue Team emphasises a critical element in the provision of emergency services that is vital for us as a parliament to support and ensure. That element is the cooperation between the different teams and branches of emergency services. Just in November of last year, the Fisher Road Coast Guard reported being part of a coalition of Coast Guard teams including the South Queens Ferry and Kinghorn Coast Guards, who combined their efforts in the search for a missing person. And similar operations of combining teams and branches of emergency services can be seen in all the aforementioned disasters from Paris to Glasgow. We see police, medics, paramedics and firefighting teams working together, working closely to provide the best emergency services possible. And I commend all of these services, whether voluntary or otherwise, on their exemplary communication that provides such a joined-up approach in an emergency. In any debate about our emergency services, we'd be remiss if we didn't make reference to the incredible work of our mountain rescue teams. These teams, based on our geographical diversity, ensure that the citizens of Scotland, as well as visitors, can safely enjoy all the wonders of nature that we have to offer. And the great work of these emergency services organisations were actually on display this past weekend when the Cairngorm Mountain Rescue Team was called out twice to perform rescue services in blizzard conditions. Closer to my own constituency, the Tweed Valley Mountain Rescue Team are seeking donations for a new state-of-the-art command and control vehicle, and they've got my very best wishes for this initiative. But I should also mention that the Scottish Government is providing funding of over £310,000 to our voluntary mountain rescue teams. We are, in fact, the only government in the UK to do so for this type of service. Presiding officer, in closing, I wish to offer my genuine gratitude to all our emergency services and to make note of the sacrifices of all kinds made by our emergency services. My thanks to all of them for their unmatched efforts to keep us all safer in times of emergency or crises. And if I had anything but water to hand, I'd raise a glass to them all. Many thanks. I now call on Graham Day to be followed by Patricia Ferguson, a generous six minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. There, there are very obvious recipients of the praise noted in the motion. We have already heard these referenced across the Chamber today. I would echo much of what has been said, and as Alison McInnes did, pay particular tribute to the power workers who have battled horrendous conditions over the past week or so to restore services to many rural households. It is all too easy to look at the update emails we as MSPs received over recent days and reflect upon the content from the perspective of the number of houses left without power. We should, of course, do that whilst at the same time consider the enormous effort in awful weather that was going on to address the situation. Uh, however, today I want to focus my contribution on a little recognised group of people whose efforts in rural parts of our country help keep Scotland safe and moving when the winter ravages descend upon us. I'm talking about farmers. Members around the Chamber who represent rural areas will be entirely aware of the role that farmers play in clearing and gritting vital remote rural routes all over our country, not only allowing residents to travel, but making it possible for the emergency services to get to these remote areas in inclement weather when they are needed. But I think it would be remiss of us in the context of the debate not to take the opportunity to highlight that contribution to a wider audience. With the best will in the world, it is unrealistic to expect rural authorities to keep at their disposal sufficient resources to be able to clear every mile of road, however hard to reach, as soon as the snow starts to fall. That is why these arrangements with local farmers are so important. The nature of the arrangements can vary from area to area and between the formal and informal. So it is actually difficult to pin down exact Scotland-wide figures, but a 2011 survey did identify that of 28 responding councils, 15 employed farmers on an ad hoc basis, whilst 13, including Angus, Perth and Kinross and Aberdeenshire, had formal agreements in place. Right now in Angus, there are 19 farmers and agricultural contractors working through Tayside contracts to spread salt, grit and plough the snow. Mainly, this is taking place in high land, Category 2 rural routes treated just before school bus in the morning, and Category 3 non-priority, mainly rural, but in some cases town residential routes across the constituencies that I and Nigel Don represent. In some instances, snow ploughs are provided by the council to be attached to the tractors. Sometimes the farmers use their own kit. The farmers then allocate the route they must keep clear, but they can also use the plough for any routes of their own choosing that they wish to clear, and that happens. Farmers I know go beyond just that. 
I'm aware of one farmer in Angus who adapted a piece of his own machinery to suck up snow along a track serving a large number of properties and blow it into a neighbouring field. And of course, we'll all be aware of instances where farmers are coming to the rescue of motorists who've slid off rural routes into ditches. But it's important to stress that the planning and the organisation which has gone into arriving at this situation with Scotland's farmers are very much part of the response to emergency or severe weather incidents. In 2012, the NFUS, along with Transport Scotland and the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation Scotland, produced guidance, the use of farmers for winter service, a code of practice for both councils and farmers, in order to, to provide minimum standards and improve the services already provided. Although it's not mandatory, it is being utilised widely and leading to greater, greater uh, consistency in winter service engagement between the local authorities and the farmers. The, the code highlights areas of regulatory compliance and risk, and I was interested to see in the latest edition of the Scottish Farming Leader an article highlighting the legal issues relating to agriculture becoming involved in such activities. It's also welcome to see that HMRC have relied relaxed the legislation covering the usage of res, red diesel and permitting it to be used while spreading materials to deal with frost, ice or snow. Presiding officer, there's a lot of smart thinking going on out there amongst our rural communities. Just before Christmas, I, I was interested to read an article about a group in the Borders who have applied for a grant from a wind farm community fund in order to buy a tractor with a snowplough and salt spreader attachments, which local farmers have come together to use. A good use of community benefit, I would suggest. Of course, the help provide, uh, farmers provide is not only limited to clearing these routes of snow and ice. Farmers are often draft, drafted in by the council to help remove trees that have blown down in storms or clear ditches when flooding poses a risk. So let's please add Scotland's farmers to those we are crediting today. In conclusion, presiding officer, can I also note the work being done by the National Farmers Union Scotland in conjunction with Scotland's charity air ambulance and the Scottish Ambulance Service to serve the cause of ensuring call-outs to rural areas are best facilitated. The initiatives designed to encourage rural workers to ensure they're able to pinpoint their exact location if they are caught up in an emergency uh, through use of grid referencing. The hope is that this will be adopted widely by those working in our land so that when the need arises, casualties or colleagues of casualties can provide identification of their location, which facilitates the swiftest possible response by the ambulance services. The NFUS is providing pocket-side grid reference cards to all members and they're looking for these to be filled in when the need arises to note unique landmarks such as locks, prominent hills, masts, water features, churches, bridges or roads. The initiative is part of the Farm, Safely, Fair Farm Safety Scotland Partnership, in which the Scottish Government is a participant, which promotes safe working environments across rural Scotland and, and tackles a number of farming-related fatalities and injuries each year. And finally, on the subject of farming and the part the industry plays in responding to emergency situations, can I commend NFUS for its continuing lobbying of the UK Government to commit to improving mobile networks across Scotland, the substandard quality of which in rural locations can present a real health and safety issue when the need to call in the blue light services arises. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's probably true to say that no one expects to have need of the emergency services. We all imagine it will happen to someone else. But we still feel safer for knowing that they are there and ready to bring their considerable expertise and skill to our aid if needed. And when something does go wrong, the police, ambulance service or fire and rescue services are, of course, our first port of call. My colleagues across the chamber have spoken of recent tragedies and disasters and of the magnificent response these services have made. And in recent years, we have unfortunately been only too well aware of their worth and value to us. However, I wanted to speak of two events from my own experience that demonstrate, I think, the expertise and the commitment of the emergency services and explain why I hold them in such high regard. The first took place many years ago now, when I was a teenager, I won't mention what year, but when as a teenager I was awoken by my parents in the middle of the night, and at that time we lived on the 21st floor of a 30-storey block of flats at Red Road in Glasgow. Now a fire had broken out on the 23rd floor, two floors above us, and my family was physically unscathed, although we were never to return to live in that home again, but tragically one 12-year-old boy lost his life. Now, we and our neighbours did what you do. We ran down the fire escape to make our way to safety. And smoke and water from the sprinkler system and from the fire began to penetrate the building. It was quite a frightening situation. 
But the reason I mention it is because it occurred to me then and has stayed with me ever since that as we were running down and out of the building, the firefighters were running in and up to the source of the fire. Now, they didn't know what to expect when they eventually got to the 23rd story, but it was their job and they would deal with it. Now, in 20, 2004, rather, a major explosion at a factory in my Maryhill constituency demolished a building, killing nine people and injuring many more. And my colleagues Hugh Henry and Hans Malik have referred, of course, to Stockline. The initial explosion took place on a Tuesday, but it took until Friday of that week to recover the last body. And with that, the last hope of finding anyone alive was extinguished. Now, for four days and four nights, the fire and rescue services worked in quite dreadful conditions, unseasonably hot May weather, dust and rubble everywhere, and a still unstable building. Now, I was on the site with the chief fire officer when the last body was found, and I remember well the feeling of utter despair is the only way I could describe it, that hit everyone. And a little later that day, my Westminster colleague Anne McEachan and I returned to the site to thank the staff who had worked so tirelessly throughout that week. And I have to say we were completely taken aback to find that a number of the firefighters most closely involved in the search of the building were very anxious and very upset and were quite desperate, I think is the only word to describe it, to know if people understood that they had tried they are very best. I have to say, presiding officer, that wasn't something that anyone had ever doubted, not even for a minute, but they're human beings and that's something we must never forget. Of course, around the city, hospitals and NHS staff <coughs> excuse me, treated the injured and police officers comforted and supported the families involved. Help was offered and came from around the country with RAF helicopters ferrying the most seriously injured to hospital and fire and rescue forces from as far afield as Leicestershire, bringing sniffer dogs and equipment. And so too did the volunteer mountain rescue teams from places like Kirkby, Stephen and Cumbria and from the Trossachs. The presiding officer, as I've indicated, our emergency services are, in my view, second to none. But the way in which local people and passers-by rally round is also inspiring. During and indeed after the Stockline tragedy, the normally busy and bustling Maryhill Road was for a time completely silent. Local shops and supermarkets donated food and other items for the families who waited for news of their loved ones and for the rescue service personnel. As Hans Alamalik mentioned, the local community central hall remained open as a base for the families. And indeed, some staff who turned up for work on Tuesday morning didn't go home until late on the Friday night as they supported and cared for people going through what was the worst experience of their lives. So it's important that we remember those who step forward from their daily lives and return to them again with little or no recognition. <coughs> Presiding officer, it's clear that across this chamber we have nothing but respect and admiration for those whose job often exposes them to danger or to experiences that must haunt them for years afterwards. But it isn't enough to respect and admire them. We must also support them and give them the resources they need. And that is why the Labour Amendment calls for an inquiry into the resilience of those services. We need to hear their views and their ideas firsthand if we are to give them that support. Now, as Hugh Henry said, Stockline happened because of neglect, because of the failure to properly maintain one small pipe. But we only found that out when we had the outcome of the inquiry that was held some four years after the disaster. We all bereaved families the opportunity to find out as quickly as is technically possible why such incidents happen. And we also owe it to the emergency services to make sure we understand those reasons and take action to make sure they never happen again so that we are not asking them to risk their lives anew. And that is why I'm pursuing a bill to reform the FAI system in Scotland. 
I hope that the Scottish Government and colleagues across this chamber will agree to that proposal in my bill, but also to the inquiry that Labour seeks. Thank you. Many, many thanks. <coughs> I now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Stuart Maxwell. A generous six minutes, Mr Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I join with colleagues in uh, praising the work of the emergency services, but I want to take uh, a slightly different view, particularly with extreme weather uh, and about the way in which we cope with these things. Because it's my fundamental belief that we can help the emergency services by not being so unprepared. And the emergency services often have much more to do from people who are not able to cope with the conditions in which this country and areas like my constituency often have to deal with. For example, this morning I heard on the radio some people whose car was stuck near Blair Athol for nine hours and they described the fact that they only had a bottle of water for the windscreen wash and weren't wearing any warm clothes. Now, the weather forecast has been very clear about the conditions in our country for driving through Dromochter and many, many other routes in these last few days. So be prepared. I used to be a scout. Let's face it, a lot of other people need to be much more prepared. Now, our ambulance services in far-flung areas like my own, you know, do sterling work. They have far longer journeys. We hear people very concerned in the cities about the uh, number of minutes that it takes to get to a major hospital. In our case, it's often the number of hours that it takes to get to a major hospital, unless you're lucky enough to get a helicopter. So we've got to make sure that the services are resilient and able to fulfil those things. And the investment in the ambulance service in particular is one that I have a lot of belief in. But some of the other services which we take for granted, like Scottish Water, you know, require things like electric pumps in order to keep the system going. So they have to be serviced such that they have emergency equipment when the electricity supply cuts out. And it was put to me by someone from Sky that it was bad to be without electricity for three days, but if the water went off as well, it really would make life fairly intolerable. Fortunately, it didn't, but it's essential that our infrastructure is not creating the kind of emergencies where uh, water bottles have got to be distributed through terrible conditions of snow and blizzards to far-flung communities. And this, I asked some of my constituents um, about their experiences of the last week, and uh, the answers that I got, you know, fall into the argument I'm making that we need to be prepared. Uh, for example, Shirley Monroe, who lives in Easter Ross, said, my thought is that, uh, that it would really be good if local radio gave out more regular information and accurate information, given the updates online are useless if you've no power and probably no mobile reception. These blackouts sadly will happen now and then, and I am grateful for those who work in often dangerous situations to get our power back on. Well, here, here. But the point is that the BBC has cut the staff who do the journalism that provides us with the information, and they have cut the local bulletins in size as well. And we're in the situation where you need to have a battery-operated radio or a wind-up one to get a service because usually you find that the power cuts are in the areas with the poorest broadband coverage. And as soon as the electricity goes off, as Shirley Monroe says here, so does all your access to that. So when the radio is telling us from the nice warm studio in Glasgow that you should look up your provider's website, get real. We need to be finding ways to make sure that people are able to get that information. And the only way is through local radio provision. And the BBC has a major role to play in that respect. And when we think, you certainly... Uh, uh, Right, on that Kenzie. point, and I, I, I'd, the, the presiding officer uh, uh, said earlier there was some time in hand, but I just thought I would 
uh, describe a situation, I think, that, that illustrates the point that Mr Gibson is trying to make. And it, 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 it concerns a situation a number of years ago over the festive period for the island I live on. Was, the water was cut off due to damage to the submarine pipe. And uh, on that occasion, the weather was so bad that it wasn't possible to transport water by boat. So Scottish water were obliged to bring water in by helicopter. And my young nephew, who was staying with us over the festive period, went back to school and um, had to uh, complete his diary of what he had done over the Christmas period. And he wrote about this experience of the helicopter bringing the water. And the teacher got in touch with his parents and said, look, you know, um, we, we're a bit concerned about your son uh, making up stories. And that shows just how little understood some of the problems that Rob's constituents and my constituents experience and take uh, almost for granted, how little understood it sometimes is in urban areas. Thank you. I'm not sure how Mr Gibson feels about another speech within his speech. We well, do have well, some time in hand and I can reimburse you. Well, well thank you very much. Very much. It was an interesting illustration of the fact that people in urban areas don't really understand what uh, it's like living in far-flung communities. And I represent many of these. My largest uh, settlement's got 9,000 people in it. You know, and uh, the point is that most people live in much smaller ones. And the point I was making about the BBC, when you think of the, about the Tory amendment, about working with uh, uh, services in other parts of the UK, they control broadcasting. They have been making the cuts we need to see those reinstated and increased in our areas. And I hope that when we recognise that we do work with the services in other parts, it would be a good idea if the services from there worked with us. And uh, that would be very helpful indeed. I just wanted to say a couple of things more. One about uh, the radio situation was exacerbated by a transmitter fault. So there was no local radio service in the Highlands or in Orkney for two or three days. I don't know what the cause of it was, but doesn't it just happen at the time of the year when we're in the middle of the blizzards and the great storms, and that's something which the infrastructure has to do about being resilient to meet those conditions. But my final thought is just about our uh, a seafarers. And mention was made by Hugh Henry about the terrible deaths in the Pentland Firth, at the edge of the Pentland Firth from the Chem Fjord. And a local fisherman sent me a note saying, I think with my 40 years of experience in the Pentland Firth, with these terrible waters, which you can never know enough about to feel safe, that there should be more broadcasts every hour, particularly when there's a major east wind coming towards the Pentland Firth, because dozens of people have died in the Firth over the years. And this particular example shows that we have to think about how we provide the emergency services. So we support the emergency uh, personnel, all of them, but we should be able to do more to help them to do their jobs when they need to. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I now call Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Paul Martin. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate and to recognise the emergency service staff who work tirelessly on our behalf. I know we're all in agreement that the way in which our emergency services have handled themselves in the face of tragedy has quite rightly given them the respect and admiration of the Scottish public. In my own lifetime, I can think of numerous examples in which emergency service personnel have faced extraordinarily challenging situations. The nature of their work means that they sometimes have to put their lives on the line to protect others. As an ex-employee of Strathclyde Fire Brigade, the most obvious example to me of the bravery of emergency services is the Cheapside Street disaster which continues to be, even 55 years later, Britain's worst peacetime fire services disaster. The disaster took place in March 1960, when fire crews attended a fire at Cheapside Street in the Anderson area of Glasgow. The fire broke out at a warehouse containing over a million gallons of whisky, and at the height of the fire, hundreds of firefighters battled the blaze. It took 11 hours to bring it under control, but during that time, 14 firefighters and five members of the Glasgow Salvage Corps were killed when an explosion within the warehouse caused the, the building's 20-metre-high wall to fall on the men below. Even though I was employed in the fire service in the 90s, that, that particular disaster in Cheapside Street was still a regular subject of discussion, debate and concern all those years later. 
It is examples like the Cheapside Street disaster that make us remember that we should never take for granted the risks taken by the men and women of the emergency services. The first such events I personally remember took place in 1971. In January of that year, the Ibrox disaster resulted in 66 deaths and more than 200 injuries. In October 71, there was the Clarkson disaster, when 22 died and around 100 were injured. Now, I remember these incidents well, not because they were large incidents or because they were relatively local to our south side Glasgow home, but because, in the case of the Ibrox disaster, my father, who was a Rangers fan, still is a Rangers fan, was at the game and was in the section of the ground at Stair 13 where the disaster occurred. He didn't return home until very, very late that night. Um, unfortunately, he was completely oblivious to what had happened at the game, as he had left the game early in disgust after Celtic had scored, leaving my mother and the rest of the family in a state of high anxiety for many, many hours. Similarly, the Clarkson disaster hit home because a neighbour of ours worked in one of the shops destroyed by the blast. Information to families at that time was scant, to say the least. But much has been learned in the decades that have followed these events. Organisational planning has been significantly improved, as is the technology and equipment that our services use. It allows, them, it allows the emergency services to keep anxious families informed of what is happening. And that is one aspect of their work that perhaps we often forget, their work in contacting and supporting the families who are waiting for news. Unfortunately, Scotland has seen a number of incidents in more recent years that have also required a response from the emergency services. In Glasgow and the west of Scotland alone, there have been a number of incidents, including the Glasgow Airport terrorist, terrorist attack, the Glasgow School of Art fire, the Clutha helicopter crash, and the tragic events of the Queen Street bin lorry accident eh, so recently. In the case of the Glasgow Airport terrorist attack, the hard work of airport staff in conjunction with their emergency personnel ensured that despite a serious terrorist attack, Glasgow Airport reopened within 24 hours, thereby reducing the negative impact of the attack on both individuals and businesses. At the Glasgow School of Art Fire, the quick action of more than 100 firefighters in a difficult environment prevented the complete destruction of a nationally and internationally significant building and a vital piece of Scotland's culture. The nature of the fire meant that fire crews had to tackle the blaze from inside the building. The bravery, skill and professionalism shown allowed the vast majority of the building to be saved, including the Macintosh Lecture Theatre and Museum, in addition to the Macintosh Archive. Recent events have also shown how our emergency services work in collaboration not only with different organisations, but also with their own backroom staff, who provide the necessary support for frontline personnel to carry out their duties. Not that long ago, I was fortunate enough to visit the Scottish Ambulance Service, who took the time to show me some of the work that takes place behind the scenes to keep their fleet of ambulances and transports running smoothly. Ambulance control centres received more than 1.8 million calls in 2013-14 and dealt with nearly 2,500 emergency calls on Hugmany alone. I saw firsthand the professionalism of phone operators in responding to calls, and it was clear that staff understood the importance of maintaining the service at a very high standard. Backroom staff must not be forgotten. They are crucial in ensuring that our frontline emergency personnel are able to carry out their duties as effectively as possible. It is this professionalism and teamwork across all of our services that has helped to deliver real progress. Whether that is the reduction of fire deaths in Scotland to their lowest ever recorded level or the reduction in recorded crime to a 40-year low. I'd also like to take this opportunity to highlight the work of our community volunteer first responders. They are often the first on the scene of a medical emergency and their training with defibrillators and oxygen therapy can mean the difference between life and death for some patients. In the west of Scotland, there are volunteer first responder units operating in Largs, Neilston, Uplamour, Arran and in the Roseneath Peninsula. The staff at Glasgow Airport and the security staff at Brayhead Shopping Centre are also part of the scheme. It is only appropriate that their willingness to sacrifice their own time as volunteers to protect the people of this country is recognised in this debate. Presenting officer, I believe all of our emergency services should be given the support they require to undertake their duties effectively and safely. I therefore regret that the UK Government closed, chose to shut the Clyde Coast Guard station located at Greenock and transfer its work to Belfast. I am concerned by reports that Belfast has been understaffed, despite assurances from Westminster that more staff would be recruited. The Scottish Government called for full responsibility over maritime transport to be transferred to the Scottish Parliament in its submission to the Smith Commission. I am therefore disappointed to see the Commission's recommendations, which state that the Scottish Government will be confined to a consultative role 
and the ability to nominate one member to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency Advisory Board. That is a shame, and it is not the way to sh show our respect for our emergency services. Finally, Presiding Officer, while most of us were at home enjoying our Christmas break, the emergency services were continuing to work hard. They are undoubtedly worthy of the praise they have received today. They work irregular hours and at times need to confront very distressing situations. I hope at least that our debate today goes some way, a little way, to showing the gratitude not only of the Scottish Parliament, but of all the people of Scotland who rely on the efforts of our emergency services. Thank you very much. And I now call Paul Martin to be followed by Willie Coffey. Presiding officer, coming into the final stages of this debate, I think there can be absolutely no doubt that the Chamber is unified in working together and supporting uh, our emergency services. Not one member has said anything other than that. And I think that's something that you know, maybe see that often uh, in this Chamber where members can agree with each other. But on this uh, very subject, I think we should uh, take, recogni and take recognition of that. And something I think at the same time we should uh, recognise that we can actually do that in the comfort uh, uh, of this chamber, uh, you know, the comfort zone that we find ourselves in here today and what we would consider uh, words that come easy to us and words that are easy words in many respects, but we don't risk our lives to uh, come to, the, to work in the job that we enjoy uh, doing every day. Uh, we don't find ourselves having to seek counselling services, something that we might joke about occasionally, but uh, we don't find ourselves in that position and we should recognise that the debate that we are having here today relates to people who have to seek uh, that kind of support. So we should think ourselves uh, in a position that being able to debate this issue uh, is in very, very much uh, in very contrast to the challenges that our emergency services find. Tragic events at uh, George's Square last month uh, and previously at the Clutha Vaults in 2013 certainly gave me a perspective. Uh, I was in Glasgow 15 minutes on the very street that the bin lorry accident took place. And it did give me a uh, perspective and I must admit at the same time when the reports came through of the major incident, uh, I always have that sense of feeling of concern uh, for the fact that there could be fatalities uh, and alarm, of course, also at the same time, our family members uh, involved in that incident. And I think all of us uh, raised uh, have obviously are concerned uh, following such events. I think the feeling intensified when the incident is in the town or city that you're familiar with. And it's always that feeling of momentary uh, panic uh, as you seek out the movements of your loved ones and uh, you make those frantic calls. But those uh, first responders, uh, we should recognise that their emotions are not such emotions like that. Uh, their emotions are using the professionalism that they have available, the, the expertise that they have available to them to ensure that they deal with a very major incident uh, and I think we should recognise today the professionalism uh, and training that has been put in place by these individuals who are prepared to do anything uh, and we know uh, from the experience of uh, Glasgow and in the Clutha Volks they were on the scene uh, almost immediately and many witnesses uh, recognised that uh, on the day. I think it's also recognised that uh, the emergency workers who were first to attend in the Clutha Volks and the George's Square, no doubt, uh, and I think we should recognise this again today, save lives, uh, and we should recognise that role that they played uh, with regards to issues uh, like dealing with the challenges that they face. The work is carried out every day. Uh, we should recognise there are no Christmas holidays, there's no uh, New Year's Day uh, for these uh, 24 hour services, 365 days a year service that's provided. Uh, firefighters, paramedics, police officers, all of these emergency services provide a valuable service to us uh, 365 days a year, as I said, 24 hours a day. Uh, and every time they get that 9-9 call, it's the same professionalism that means everything to them and everything that they have to ensure that they deliver a good public service. As well as recognising the emergency services who attended the events I've referred to, I would also like to mention the public uh, who assisted in many witness accounts of these events, recognised that members of the public giving comfort to those who were injured, uh, dealing with many of the challenges that faced uh, the scene surrounding that, and I think we should recognise that. I'd also like to today uh, mention the church leaders who played a crucial role in comforting uh, uh, members, bereaved members, uh, family members who were bereaved, and dealing with families who found themselves in this 
a severe trauma situation. I think it should be recognised the comforts provided by those church leaders during what has been a traumatic time uh, for many family members. President Officer, I would like uh, others like to say that I support, and I think we should support, the government's uh, motion. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think members should support the amendment that I think constructively has been brought forward by Hugh Henry today. I think far too often we have debates in this parliament that we mean so well to take forward issues, uh, and we again speak the warm words, I think Hugh Henry referred to this, but surely it should be for us as a parliament to look at how we can use the experiences of uh, these individuals who have so much to offer to ensure that we actually learn from uh, their experiences in Parliament. I appreciate the challenges that our various committee members face and committees face in this Parliament, but surely the challenges that face the Justice Committee are nowhere near in comparison to the challenges that face our emergency services. Uh, so surely we can look at ways in which we can perhaps make time to ensure that the experiences of these individuals can be taken into careful consideration and they actually feel that we are making a difference in this Parliament. I recall uh, when I was first elected in 1999 uh, in the first term of the Parliament meeting with uh, fire officers who advised me that they were attending 9-9 uh, nine -nine calls and were being targeted by youths lobbing bricks at them uh, and adults who had air guns and were using the fire appliances as target practice. As a result of the experience of these individuals, I brought forward an amendment to legislation uh, in the Parliament, which at a later stage brought forward the Emergency Workers' Bill. And we have, in fact, during, that, uh, during the, the following years, brought forward a number of pieces of legislation to give that protection uh, to our emergency services. I would not have been able to bring forward uh, that legislation or the proposals to the amendments that we brought forward if I hadn't heard from the fire officers themselves to advise me of the challenges that they faced. I also heard from paramedics who advised me of some of the challenges that they faced in the city centre in Glasgow. I was horrified to hear that those who were given up, uh, you know, who, who were committing themselves to the public service were being targeted. I actually think they have benefited from the legislation that we have delivered in this parliament that we've come together to deliver. And in fact, the zero tolerance approach, I think in many communities, and I know in the area I've rep I represent, has actually benefited from that. So why can't we uh, ensure that we give that opportunity to those individuals to at least amplify their concerns uh, in this, in this, uh, to the various committees that are available to us? Can I just say in, in conclusion, President Officer, I think this has been a good debate. It's been worthy uh, of the Parliament. Uh, but I would ask the Minister, and, and perhaps in the, uh, the spirit of the First Minister's uh, recent new, newly elected First Ministers uh, uh, you know, working together with members and cooperating with members, Perhaps today we should consider carefully the amendment that has been brought forward by Hugh Henry uh, to give uh, those emergency services out there an opportunity to contribute to Parliament. Thank you very much. And our final open debate speaker before we come to closing speeches is Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer. Uh, this debate has been a, a good opportunity for members to pay tribute to Scotland's emergency service personnel and to put on record our thanks as parliamentarians for the vital work they do to keep all of us safe. Their vigilance on our behalf and their brave action when lives are in peril are appreciated the length and breadth of this country by communities, families and individuals who can find themselves caught up in the most distressing of circumstances as they go about their daily business. Colleagues around the chamber have reminded us of the horrific events in Glasgow, at George Square and elsewhere and paid tribute to the victims who lost their lives, the injured and all the families affected, and to the magnificent responders and crews who rushed to the scene to give assistance. My own constituency was not without incident either. Uh, within two days over the 22nd and 24th of December, we saw our local emergency service teams rescuing passengers from a train that had run into flood water down the line from Kilmarnock at Mochlin having to free about 30 people. Over 40 people had to be rescued by dinghies from the Asda store in Kilmarnock when the whole area was flooded. And there were a spate of road accidents in the area, two of which were separated only by a few minutes on the same stretch of the A77, which very sadly led to a fatality. These incidents all presented different challenges to the teams 
as, and as we might expect, their skill in carrying out these rescues in dangerous conditions is a testament to their dedication and professionalism. And I thank all of the emergency staff who were involved in those incidents. Presiding officer, in 2008, my constituent, Alison Hume, lost her life when she fell into a mine shaft only yards from her home in Galston. That night, despite the issues that were subsequently raised on the management of the rescue operation, there were some outstanding feats of bravery and compassion shown by the rescue personnel at the scene who descended into the shaft to assist Alison despite the risks to their own safety. Ultimately, Alison's life was not saved, but the bravery of those officers who did their best to rescue her has, to my knowledge, never been recognised. And that is a mistake, in my view, that should be corrected and is also supported by Alison's family. Our emergency service personnel are a unique breed of people. They go to work just as many of the rest of us do, but at the back of their minds, they must be thinking, this could be the day when I'm called upon to act to save a life, and in so doing, put my own life at risk too. I think that takes a special type of person to do that type of work. Thankfully, in Scotland, we have an abundance of such men and women who are prepared to risk their own lives to save others, and we should thank them for this at every opportunity. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary might give some thought to introducing a, a Scottish Parliament Award for outstanding feats of bravery in the line of duty by our emergency service personnel and indeed by ordinary citizens who also come to the aid of their fellow citizens in distress. We're lucky in Scotland to be witnessing a 40-year low in recorded crime. We have a thousand extra police officers on our streets and the number of our citizens who are likely to become victims of crime has dropped again and is lower than it is in England and Wales. More people feel safer in their communities and their perceptions about local crime rates staying the same or improving has gone up significantly to about 76%. In terms of personnel, on top of those extra police officers, our numbers of ambulance technicians and paramedics have both increased since 2007 by roughly 16 and by 12%. Numbers of consultants and nurses are well up on the levels they were at in 2006. We see high levels of public confidence in our accident and emergency services that the service can meet their needs over the winter. And at 63%, this is significantly higher a figure than 46% which is reflected in other countries in the UK. And now, in all parts of Scotland, as a result of the Alison Hume case, crews have direct access to specialist equipment and expertise to effect rescues wherever they may be needed. In terms of performance, our call-out response times are the best in the UK, where our ambulance crews respond to incidents on average within six and a half minutes. Our A&E performance in September was 93.5%, again the best in the UK. What that means is that about 750,000 patients were seen within four hours. Our air in Monklands, Monklands A&E units alone have dealt with over 800,000 attendances. And these, of course, would be clogging up other A&E departments if those units had been closed some years ago. Presiding officer in Scotland, we can be proud of our emergency service personnel and volunteers who day in and day out put themselves at great risk in order to keep us safe and rescue us when called upon to do so. It's right that the Parliament has a debate like this to pay tribute to those wonderful people and we have heard many examples today of the professionalism and courage that our emergency service teams display every day in some part of Scotland. May we, as a parliament, congratulate them and thank them for everything that they do. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings us to closing speeches. I remind members, if they've participated in this debate, they should be back in the chamber for closing speeches. A call on Jamie McGregor. Seven minutes, please, Mr McGregor. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to close today's debate, uh, which has been useful and largely consensual as befits the subject. Um, as Jackson Carlow said earlier, the Scottish Conservatives welcome the opportunity to commend and pay tribute to all those who help keep us safe in emergencies. We are indeed fortunate to have such first-class emergency service workers and volunteers in Scotland, and it is right that the Parliament takes time to put our gratitude on record to all of those involved in our emergency services, to those who often risk their lives to save the lives of others. And I also associate the Scottish Conservatives with all the comments that have been made in relation to the first-class work of the emergency services during the tragic Glasgow bin lorry crash just before Christmas and the Clutha Bar tragedy last year, and also with those tributes that have been made by members to all of our policemen and women, ambulance crews, and fire and rescue service workers. But as an MSP for the Highlands and Islands, I want to highlight in particular the work of our dedicated and brilliant RNLI lifeboat crews, as a number of other members have done today already. I have a long family association with the RNLI, as my late father, Charles McGregor, became Scottish convener of the RNLI and travelled to lifeboat stations all over Scotland. And it was a huge honour for my family when the RNLI representatives played a part in his funeral by wrapping his coffin in a lifeboat flag and providing a detail to carry it to his grave in Dalmally Churchyard. Um, the RNLI's 47 Scottish stations provide a vital 24-hour-a-day search and rescue service and help the lives of hundreds of people, including fishermen, help save their lives each and every year. Tobermory RNLI station in my region is one of Scotland's busiest, along with the Oban station. And I want to pay special tribute to my constituent, Tobermory's Jane Griffiths, one of the RNLI's first female coxswains, who has just stepped down after almost 20 years of service. Her commitment and dedication is an example to us all. Volunteers make up 95% of the charity lifeboat crew members and shore crew, and we should also record our thanks to those who raise vital funds for the RNLI and other charities working to provide emergency services. I'm talking about the people who run the lifeboat tents at shows all over Scotland and who collect for the lifeboats on the street in all weathers and for other charities. And we are an island race surrounded by sea and the realization of the perils of the deep is embedded in the bloodstream of our nation. Another category, one response group which is of real importance to my region again both to local residents and to visitors, are our Scottish Mountain Rescue Teams, again mentioned by others in this chamber. Scotland has 27 volunteer mountain rescue teams, the majority of which are based in my region. And they're made up of over 1,000 volunteers, plus an additional three police teams and an RAF team. They operate effectively and safely 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, in all weather conditions, and help save the lives of dozens of walkers and climbers. Just last weekend, three people were rescued from the Cairn Gorms in blizzard conditions in two separate operations by the Cairn Gorm Mountain Rescue Team. And their knowledge and expertise is world class, and I commend all those who volunteer with our mountain rescue teams and those who fundraise so hard to support them. The Order of St. John as a sponsor of our mountain rescue teams, has given wonderful support through the provision of Land Rovers. Um, and I would also wish to take this opportunity to reinforce the message that our mountain rescue teams consistently seek to put across, namely, that more people need to be aware of and prepared for the weather conditions that can be encountered in our hill and mountain ranges. And I recognize that winter, winter climbing is a rewarding activity for many and important to the Scottish economy. It's especially important to the Fort William area um, where it is done a lot of the time. But the ferocious and fast-changing weather should never be underestimated. As one young man 
an experienced mountain climber who himself narrowly escaped death in the Cairngorms after stepping over a blind cornice last year, warned recently, you can have all the training and all the kit and skills, but that doesn't mean you're prepared to deal with the fact that poor visibility can make you oblivious to what is three feet in front of you. People just assume that because it's in the UK, it must be nice and rambly. But that's not the case. Scottish mountains can kill you, whether it's avalanches or the weather being truly horrendous. It can change very quickly, and people don't realise how hard it can be to get out of it when it happens. Uh, before closing, presiding officer, I would like to put on my record my thanks to all those who are involved with rescues on our freshwater locks, rivers and inland waters. Um, again, this is a very important service, but it is a bit um, spasmodic in the fact that Loch Lomond, for example, has the Loch Lomond, Loch Lomond Angling Association, which has a rescue boat. Uh, Loch Ness is covered by the RNLI, but some of the other lochs in Scotland, the freshwater lochs, are not covered by any specific bodies. And uh, recently in Loch Awe, where I live, we had the tragedy of the four people who were drowned. Since then, there has been uh, a charity put forward which has raised enough funds to buy a small boat. Uh, a loch Watch, Loch Awe, it is called, and it's done well. But uh, unfortunately, I, d I don't see it as being as sustainable unless there is some funding from somewhere to, um, uh, to come across and, and provide some sort of core funding for this operation. So until that happens, I'm afraid that some of the bigger locks, freshwater areas in Scotland, will be uh, basically uh, without major cover. And I think that's something that should be looked at. I'm only suggesting that uh, now. Um, so um, local residents deserve praise and supports for the actions uh, which they take in regard to freshwater um, safety. Uh, but I think some core funding uh, must be called for, uh, for areas where uh, there is none. And I support the amendment in Jackson Carlaw's name, and again, thank all of Scotland's emergency service workers whose role is incredibly important to all of our constituents. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, before I move on, I note that a couple of members were missing at the start of closing speeches. The Chamber has received the courtesy of an explanation from one of the members. However, I note that Hans Alamalik is still missing from the Chamber, and I regret that, and I trust that an explanation will be forthcoming. I call on Dr Richard Simpson. Nine minutes or so, Dr Simpson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be summing up and supporting Labour's amendment in what has been, for the most part, a consensual debate. This debate has allowed the Parliament to acknowledge the debt of gratitude we have to our emergency service men and women, whether they be fully employed by the major blue light or uniformed services, or part-time as in volunteer fire services workers like Mike McKenzie, uh, or who, as Alison McInnes pointed out, the, the volunteer fire workers actually make up 40% of our service, or indeed those who undertake the work uh, employing their professional skills but in a voluntary capacity, such as the doctors in BASIC, which has not been mentioned today, the, uh, who support the fire, police and ambulance and road accidents, or volunteers like the first responders, as Roderick Campbell reminded us. Many of the members who have spoken do so from personal contact or ex political experience with disasters. Patricia Ferguson spoke in, speaking graphically on Stockline and reminding us of the consequences of the delay in FAIs and the impact that has not just on those who suffered but on the service, emergency services. A number like Hazala Malik and Colin Beattie spoke on the Clutha disaster and Paul Martin on the recent Glasgow George Square accident, Clyde Patterson on Clyde Bank and Elaine Murray reminded us about the recent Paris events where the army and police of various types were involved as well as the Glasgow Art School fire. What's clear to me from all these accounts is the huge degree of professionalism of our core services, the ability of different organisations to deploy their particular skills in what Christine Graham graphically described in the TV at River incident as a seamless and coordinated way. Linking volunteers, however, with these core services is also vital. For example, 
There are, there are 95 uh, British Association for Immediate Care medics, that's the basic medics, uh, connected to the ambulance service. And that sort of connection, I think, is very important. Uh, I think when we hear to, in, in the last few days of Pauline Cafferty's improvement, we should today of all days pay tribute to those from the health services and fire services who volunteer to work in international disaster sites, to the tsunamis, earthquakes, and as climate change affects the world with flooding like that in Malawi, which we heard in FMQs this morning. These are countries without the resource to tackle the consequences, and our volunteers play a vital role. Médecins Sans Frontières, which I'm a particular advocate of and is BM, BMA's Christmas uh, charity, uh, working currently in Syria, North Pakistan, and now West Africa, you know, in circumstances which we could only think about. I mean, it just, we can't imagine uh, what they have to face on a day-and-day -day basis. Today, uh, members, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on accident and emergency staff, but I can say that anyone who has witnessed a busy shift, uh, and there are more and more in that category, has to applaud the nurses and doctors and indeed other staff in our a and &E departments. This is not just a winter thing. This is an all-year-round thing now. I, I recently visited our only charitable air ambulance in Schoon in my constituency. Now, before they got underway, there was a question, would they actually be fully utilised? Did we need it, in addition to the two NHS ambulances? But I can say, and I'll make this as one of the few political points in, in this speech, that, that the air ambulances flew 3,427 sorties last year. They are actually becoming essential to our service. And with the major trauma units about to come on stream, we will need more air ambulance provision, not less. And if the Kerr and Christie reports are acted upon, then rationalisation for patient safety and only secondly for cost effectiveness will demonstrate that need as elective procedures are held in one hospital but all acute in another hospital. The acute will need that transport. So I would encourage members to support the charitable air ambulance system. Presiding officer listing all the emergency services and groups inevitably mean that some group are left out. I wouldn't, for example, have thought of the farmers without Graham Day, Day's excellent description of the work that they do on our behalf. Jackson Carlo also reminded us of those who are usually unsung, like GCHQ, often unrecognized. And I would like to add, as Elaine Murray did, the civilian support staff. I'm glad that also we have, albeit as a country, belatedly recognized the Bevan boys and the Arctic merchant seamen. Uh, these, I think, were important individuals during the war who have only recently been recognized. Jackson Carlo also referred to the hoax callers as unacceptable, and Paul Martin reminded us that after listening to emergency service staff, we legislated for those who were being physically abused. So listening is important. But, presiding officer, I must join Alison McInnes and others to praise those electricity supply workers who've worked tirelessly in the, in the recent past in, uh, to reconnect remote supplies, to network rail and transport staff for their efforts in these last few days to keep our rail and road system functioning. Today, presiding officer, many members like Roderick Campbell have spoken eloquently about their local services and indeed about their personal experiences. Patricia Ferguson reminding us of the image Firefighters going up that tower block when she and her family were coming down. That resonated strongly with me. I, I experienced on one occasion uh, the support of a voluntary fire service chief officer in my practice. I was called upon to talk down a mentally ill patient from a ledge on the main street in Bridge of Allen. Having a fear of heights at that time, which I fortunately not got now, I was really quite terrified. Uh, and, the, and the officer, who was about half my size and half the size of my patient, successfully managed to help us both to, to, to come down, and he did not jump. So I owe them a personal debt. Cabinet Secretary Hugh Henry and others have referred to the Mountain Rescue Team. I, I'm not going to add to their uh, uh, really significant descriptions. 25 lives may have been lost in a year, but how many more were saved? Many owe their lives to these 1,000 volunteers. The RNLI, which Jamie McGregor talked of from his only family experience, must be surely one of the best examples of a volunteer scheme. And as Mike McKenzie said, who amongst us would go out on the sea in storms like the weather bomb that we've had recently? Um, the St Andrews Service and Red Cross are another two groups that not only respond, but attend so many sporting and other events where you never know what's actually going to happen. But they also train others in basic first aid, so they spread 
the emergency service. In my particular constituency, and again in Bridge of Allen Primary School, I was delighted recently to present certificates to the trainers who will then train the pupils in cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If we spread this amongst our community, we increase the resilience of our community. So schemes like that, supported by the British Heart Foundation, are important. Presiding officer, our amendment asks that as a parliament we go beyond ward words. And of course, funding the core services, we, 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 we do go beyond. But it is about resilience. We interact at, and should do so directly with our frontline staff. I will be not instructing committees to undertake inquiries, but what I will be saying is asking, and I will certainly ask the Health Committee to invite, uh, to invite our uh, frontline staff, not just the managers who we've already in interviewed about resilience, but we will invite them. Because as members, some members said, we must listen to these frontline staff and take the time to do so, even in our very crowded, when I accept they are crowded, agendas. I want to make two further points, one philosophical, one practical. In Scotland, we have one unique funding approach in support of our hospices, a promise made 30 years ago that the government would match pound for pound every pound that the public contributed. It, it's controlled by budgets and things, but it is basically the situation still 30 years on. Presiding officer, it's my belief that in an era where authority and government have increasingly small standing, this approach to some of our voluntary services would renew a partnership between government and people. So the funds raised for the lock or scheme, if they were matched by the government, that would send a message to that community. We value what we're do you're doing and we want to support it. So I would commend that particular proposal to, to the chamber. And it's in fact contained in some very good papers by the Carnegie Trust entitled The Enabling State, uh, written by Sir John Elvidge, one of our foremost previous civil servants, and I would commend that to members, as a way in which the state can support our communities. The other issue born out of my experience that I want to mention was in treating a police officer years after the Lockerbie disaster and, and recognizing that he was suffering from unrecognized post-traumatic stress disorder. Alison McInnes mentioned the stress number of police off with stress. But we need to be mindful of the effect upon our men and women in the emergency services. Not only do they put themselves at immediate risk, but they can also pay a heavy price psychologically. We must be open about this. We must ensure that they know that we recognise that problem and will support them. To to close, please, Presiding officer, sir. it's good that we've reflected on all whose job is in the emergency service, the volunteers and others, the blue light and uniformed services. But I hope that we will pass Labour's amendment to send a clear message that we will listen and we will look at this. Not to pass that amendment, I think, would send the wrong message. I hope it will be supported. Thank you very much. And I now call on Maureen Watt to wind up the debate. Minister, 10 minutes or so. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to close this debate today. It has been very wide-ranging and very interesting. What we have all managed to agree on, though, is that without a doubt our emergency services face tough and difficult situations on a daily basis. I would like to take this opportunity to echo what others have said this afternoon and pass on my own gratitude to each and every member of our emergency services, as well as those who volunteer their spare time to help those in need, no matter what the circumstances. It is clear that at some time in our lives, each and every one of us, or someone we know, will rely on the skills and dedication of the emergency service personnel. And it's that dedication to deliver these services day in, day out, that we commend here today. And I echo Elaine Murray's and Patricia Ferguson's concern about the recognition, Patricia, in relation to the, the stock line firefighters. Um, and I think that public opinion these days is very much in favour of our emergency services and the public do recognise that. And they do recognise also that things can't be fixed immediately in certain situations, but that our emergency services are doing their very best. And I wish sometimes that the press would reflect um, that too. And I think we would also agree with um, Jackson Carlaw in his concern um, about hoax calls. And while the majority of people use uh, very responsibly um, our emergency services and the call lines, um, there are any acts of malicious and nuisance calling, 
calling are taken very seriously and the Scottish Government fully supports our police and prosecutors who um, hold these people responsible and to account. But I can uh, also assure him that the services make every effort to identify calls which may be linked to mental health uh, issues and advise the relevant uh, agencies accordingly. So the, uh, the commitment of our emergency services is recognised by the uh, examples shared in today's, today's debate uh, of how men and women serving in our emergency services respond to, on a day-to-day -day basis to a wide and diverse range of situations of varying degrees of risk and challenge, some of which may indeed put um, their own lives at risk. And it's been great to see how members contributing today have recognised a huge variety of um, volunteers and services. Mike McKenzie's very emotional speech mentioned here the volunteer firefighters and the Coast Guards, and Elaine Murray rightly recognised uh, the people who clear our road and rail services, and Alison McKinnish mentioned the engineers on our, our rail lines. And Hans Alan Manick very rightly recognised the contribution of um, the mosques and other faith services, and we should recognise the Samaritans, the street pastors, and the Red Cross. And you know, who can forget uh, Lawrence Whitley of Glasgow Cathedral? Uh, on the great work that he did in supporting the families after Clutha, and similarly Archbishop Tartaglia after um, the Bin Lorry uh, disaster. And as um, um, Dr Simpson rightly recognised Graeme Day mentioning, uh, the farmers, uh, I have also had to help people out with snowdrifts as a farmer's daughter, but also had to be uh, rescued myself, so it was very good that he mentioned that. But, you know, we should all remember, too, that, as Rob Gibson mentioned, the personal resilience is really important, and that adds up to uh, community resistance, um, which is helped, as Stuart Maxwell recognised, by the first uh, responders and the um, availability of um, defibrillators in our society. So saving lives and bringing new lives into the world is part of the day-to-day -day job, which must be daunting and as well as sometimes very exciting. <clears throat> but keeping, keeping Scotland safe must be a job that brings a sense of satisfaction, which few careers can profess to offer. And I would encourage Scotland's young people to consider a career in the emergency services when they're looking at their futures. Job satisfaction rates from the recent 2014 NHS Scotland staff survey found that 85% of Scottish ambulance service staff who answered the survey were happy to go to the extra mile at work. And I would, suspect, I would expect such survey results to be typical of all our emergency services, which reinforces the positive attitude our workforce have, further enhancing our trust and confidence in them. So it should absolutely go without saying that the Scottish Government is equally committed to supporting our emergency services to ensure they continue to keep the whole population of Scotland safe. We heard earlier that the Scottish Government is the only government in the UK to provide annual grant funding to its National Mountain Rescue Service. We want to ensure that Scotland's national environment and alluring landscape is accessible uh, to those who wish to explore it in the knowledge that help is in a hand should the unpredictable climatic con conditions result in their getting into difficulty. <clears throat> but as Jamie McGregor said, they should still be very mindful of being well equipped when they go into the mountains. In these circumstances, the Scottish Ambulance Service has a range of specialist services it can deploy, including the National Specialist Emergency Transport and Receival, Retri Ret Retrieval Service, ScotStar for short, launched in April last year. The ScotStar service is aimed at helping a range of critically ill patients by providing a single specialist integrated service across Scotland. These services are world class and highlight the fact that Scotland is leading the way in providing services that protect the people the length and breadth of Scotland. Of course, we always want to do more and work together even more effectively. A key area where we can do more is in improving the coordination and effectiveness 
of the response to cardiac arrests. If we do this well, more lives could be saved. The Scottish Government are working with the Scottish Ambulance Service, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Police Scotland, third sector organisations and other stakeholders to develop a new strategy to be launched in spring to ensure outcomes for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in Scotland are that the outcomes are as good as anywhere in the world. 2014 was a year that saw both tragedy and triumph. Our emergency services demonstrated that whatever the circumstances, they have tried and tested ways of working together to provide a professional, coordinated and immediate response to major incidents and events. That, as has already been mentioned, was seen by all of us most recently at the tragic events in George Square on the 22nd of December. Despite what can be only described as the worst circumstances, Everyone who helped during that tragedy acted courageously and with compassion, and for that they should be very proud. Most of us can only thankfully imagine how difficult that must have been. Because of the distressing nature of the work, it is also important that emergency service staff are given the space, time and opportunity to look after their own health and well-being, and several members mentioned that today. The emergency services take their responsibility for staff well-being extremely seriously and have programmes in place to provide support. For example, the Scottish Ambulance Service provides formal counselling to all staff as part of their employee counselling service. This service supports staff with information on where to find relevant help, especially following mass casualty incidents. The Scottish Fire and Rescue work with the River Centre in Edinburgh offer treatment for trauma-related problems to all fire staff. This is an example of excellent working between our emergency services and NHS boards. The Scottish Government welcomes and encourages more of this collaborative way of working. And uh, the cha there are obviously chaplains also to uh, support these services, and there are also chaplains trained for major incidents. To enhance this, the Scottish Government announced last year that money received from the UK Government due to LIBOR fines could be used for wellbeing projects to support staff within all three of the emergency services, as well as a number of other voluntary services. We should remember, however, and recognise that these services excel not only in times of tragedy, but at times of celebration too. In stark contrast, our emergency services can be proud of their part in delivering the most successful and safe Commonwealth Games, where 1.2 million tickets were sold with around 690,000 Games-related visitors attending events over the Games period. We should also recognise the many employers who recognise that their employees wish to be volunteers and retain firefighters and crew our lifeboats, for example, and be team members of the Mountain Rescue Service and they allow and let their employees off um, to do that work. <clears throat> Finally, may I express my gratitude at being given the chance to offer my personal thanks to all staff within the emergency services, both onshore and offshore, including our offshore uh, installations, because we have had some uh, incidents related to our offshore installations. Um, and I would uh, also like to thank all those members who have expressed their thanks during the course of this debate. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for the government to direct Parliament, but if parliamentary committees wish to hold inquiries, of course the government will cooperate. But I can reassure Hugh Henry, Hans and Alan Marek and the Labour benches that day in, day out, our government ministers meet with all services mentioned to ensure that we're delivering at the very best possible level. We've all been inspired by the stories that we've heard today and our emergency and voluntary services can be very proud of what they do. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes the debate on commending the people who keep Scotland safe in emergencies. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 12062, 
In the name of Liz Smith, on the reappointment of a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland, I call on Liz Smith to move the motion on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And could I seek your permission to speak to the motion in my name as a member of the SPCB, which invites members of the Parliament to agree the reappointment of Mrs Julie Ward as member of the Standards Commission for Scotland? As members know, the Standards Commission's role is to encourage the highest ethical standards in public life, and it does this by promoting and enforcing the codes of conduct for councillors and members of devolved public bodies. In addition to promoting the codes, the Commission receives reports from the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland following his investigation into an alleged breach of the code. And if the Commission upholds the Commissioner's findings, then it determines in accordance with the legislation the sanction to be applied. Turning to the reappointment process under the Scottish Parliamentary Commissions and Commissioners etc. Act 2010, members of the Commission are reappointed by the SPCB with the agreement of the Parliament. The SPCB sat as a reappointment panel on the 10th of December 2014. I chaired the panel and the other members were Liam MacArthur and David Stewart. I thank Louise Rose for confirming by way of a validation certificate that this nomination is made on merit following a fair and robust appointment process which conform to good practice. Details of the information considered by the SPCB and the criteria on which Mrs Ward was assessed has been set out in the report lodged by the SPCB in SPICE. Julie Ward will be, we believe, continue to promote and ensure high ethical standards that are upheld in public life by councillors and members of the devolved public bodies, and we wish her continued success in her role as a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Ms Smith. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 11999 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Modern Slavery Bill UK legislation. I call on Michael Matheson to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12060.2 in the name of Hugh Henry, which seeks to amend motion number 12060 in the name of Michael Matheson on commending the people who keep Scotland safe in emergencies be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12060.2 in the name of Hugh Henry is as follows. Yes, 27. No, 78. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12060.1 in the name of Jackson Carlaw, which seeks to amend motion number 12060 in the name of Michael Matheson on commending the people who keep Scotland safe in emergencies be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is not agreed to. Right, OK, can I put the question again? The question is that amendment number 12060.1 in the name of Jackson Carlaw, which seeks to amend motion number 12060 in the name of Michael Matheson, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. The next question is at motion number 12060 in the name of Michael Matheson as amended on commending the people who keep Scotland safe in emergencies be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12062 in the name of Liz Smith on the reappointment of a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 11999 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Modern Slavery Bill UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.